lost my glasses. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Tom Lawson, the Dean of the Art School here. Um, I'd like to welcome you to CalArts. Um, this is going to be something of a sad occasion, but also, I hope, rather sweet and uh, regenerative for us all. Um, we're here to grieve the passing of a friend and a colleague, um, and it's really quite right that we allow ourselves to grieve and sorrow over that. Um, but we're also here to celebrate a life and to give thanks for that and for all that we have learned and enjoyed in knowing Michael. Michael Asher was a great artist. He was one of the most singular and important figures of the last half century. An artist who accepted and fought for the idea that art is a complex intellectual activity that is developed in terms of space and light and directed at analyzing and contesting the unquestioned and often invisible power structures, be they institutional or even, or more broadly, cultural. Michael was a great artist, but he was also a true friend, an amazing colleague, and a very generous teacher. And in many ways, his role as teacher encompassed all else in his life. And I would just add that that's, I think, why it's so important that we're doing this memorial here at CalArts, which was the center of his teaching. A piece that he created here in this main gallery in 1977 captures his spirit. Someone had had the idea of mounting a show of student and faculty work with the students down here in the main space and the faculty up above in the mezzanine. Michael had his reservations about this, um, questions about the hierarchical order of, of placing uh, teachers over students, kind of what that meant to be um, hovering over your mentees. Um, and so he decided that he, he needed to think about it. And he um, ultimately uh, placed his intervention in the space in between in this, um, in this area. Um, and you'll see a couple of images of that in the, in the program. Um, what he did by doing this was uh, created a situation um, in which all involved had to consider their position to each other and to the school um, and to the very idea of art and art making. It's a very simple idea and very pure Michael. When I came here 22 year odd years ago to take up this position as dean, I, I have to confess I was really um, a little nervous about um, and, and intimidated by Michael's reputation. Um, I, I assumed that he would analyze and question my every move. But instead, I found a, a, a patient and very generous colleague eager to explain through example and description the complex ways that the art school helps make artists out of its students. How the sometimes relentless questioning, prodding and pushing gives the students the tools necessary to become strong, independent artists capable of addressing the broader culture as they enter and confront it. He really, I think, embodied the somewhat athwart the mainstream idea that we have here at CalArts about how to educate artists. This is all serious stuff. And if, you know, as I kind of have indicated, he was a very serious person. Um, but his conversation was always punctuated by that inimitable laugh. And even in those last years when I spoke with him on the phone on occasion, he always found a way to laugh. We all miss him very deeply. As we start the program, I'd like to um, invite Stephen Levine to come up and address, if, address us as uh, the president of the college. Many of you knew Michael far better than I did. Uh, I still wanted to speak because while every faculty member makes a contribution to the life of an institution, 
there are only a few who help set the standard and create the nature of the institution. And for CalArts, uh, Michael was such a faculty member. I encountered him when I was first visiting CalArts before I had the job. I came in late one morning to be interviewed and there was a group of students gathered along that wall with a faculty member I didn't know. And later when the interview was done about 9 p.m., I went to leave and that same faculty member was there with his students and uh, I actually interrupted and asked what was going on and discovered that I'd wandered into a, a legend <laughs> and was very embarrassed at my own ignorance. Um, I, I would say as, as the leader of an institution, uh, I was, or I try to lead, um, I was also always intimidated by Michael. Um, I always sort of felt as uh, we would meet in the corridor that he was uh, assessing my place in the institution, not quite saying what was on his mind, and then he would smile that smile of benediction of his, and I'd think, well, I, I passed for this time. Um, it's okay. Um, one of the things I admired is working for an institution, you actually end up with empathy for other institutions. And so I could... <laughs> Is it, is it so funny? <laughs> Someone has to be, feel, feel sorry for them. Um, so when, when, I, when that brilliant project uh, at MoMA, um, listing the works that had been deacquisitioned, I knew what that would feel like if you were the director of MoMA, and that that would sting. <laughs> or asking the Whitney to stay open 24 hours a day for seven days and the Whitney only being able to afford uh, to do it for three days. <laughs> um, one of the things I loved was uh, the gentleness with which he greeted both those things, allowing that brochure at the moment to be behind the counter and you had to ask for it, a little mercy to the institution. Um, and. Um, being realistic when Whitney couldn't stay open and, uh, and letting it pass. Um, I was just now in China at a meeting of what were putatively the 12 most influential art schools in the world. Um, everybody knew about CalArts, uh, but everybody was curious about Michael Asher. And I had journalists from the Chinese art press coming up to ask whether it really could be true that someone would do that for their students. And I had the presidents of other institutions saying, would, could it really have happened? Uh, our faculty wouldn't do that. Um, and being in a kind of awe when they discovered it really did happen. Um, Michael will go on um, helping to set the standard uh, for what we are. Um, one way we hope to put ourselves in a position of not forgetting is, and this is actually Kathy, I don't know, I haven't seen if Kathy Opie's here, uh, but Kathy Opie called me immediately after the news got out and said, um, you should start a scholarship in Michael's name and I will make the first contribution for it and she sent in her contribution that day. So we will, we will do that, um, and some of you will hear from us in the course of that, uh, but today is not the day to talk about that, only to say that uh, that is a piece of keeping uh, Michael before us uh, for as long as CalArts goes on. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say a few words about the shape of the afternoon. Um, we're, we're gathering here um, at this time because this was the time of Michael's class. And like that class, there's going to be a little bit of structure and a lot of openness. Um, a number of people have agreed to, um, to speak and um, 
they have prepared remarks and they'll be coming up shortly um, in alphabetical order. And some people who had agreed to do that found they couldn't make it here. Um, the traveling from the East Coast or Europe was too much. Um, and so Susan Morgan and I will read um, the text that they sent us. Um, and in one case, we have a video um, that somebody sent us. So we have a, a number of presentations. Um, after that, um, Vicky Ray will play um, a short John Cage piece. Uh, John Cage was somebody that Michael admired and enjoyed. Um, and after that, um, we'll open up the, um, the mic to any of you who wish to come forward and share further memories and stories and, and whatever. Um, this event is being live streamed, um, which means that there are people around the world watching us right now. Um, as I heard just before we started, we have over 50 people already signed on, which is quite remarkable. Um, and I just wanted to kind of tell another story of Michael and his, uh, his sort of analytic diligence and prescience that sometime in the late 90s, uh, the art faculty really thought that it was high time that we started live streaming our visiting artist lectures and none of us knew how to do it. Michael volunteered to be a one-man committee to discover what to do. Um, and as many of you know, Michael didn't have a computer or ever go, <laughs> go online. Um, and he interviewed people, read things, did his usual um, kind of in-depth analysis, and came back to us with a very detailed report which he read to us, full of technical jargon, and then collapsed in giggles. <laughs> so where are we? Um, at some point, we, we have to vacate this space We're at somewhere around 5 o'clock, because um, CalArts continues and there's something else happening. At that time, um, you're all invited to go over to Langley, which is around the back there. We have some light refreshments and we can continue talking. Um, anyway, so um, I think it's time to start um, hearing from people and I'd like to call up Tom Anderson. And people can either use this mic or that mic, depending on how they feel about being in front of the projection. Um, I could probably tell you what Michael was thinking when he saw you, Stephen, but I won't. Um, I, I probably knew Michael uh, longer than anyone here, or maybe I should say before anyone. We went to the same high school. Uh, we were in the same graduating class, and um, when we were in the classes together, we always sat next to each other um, for the same reason that I'm speaking first today. Uh, in those days, you sat... <laughs> yeah. In those days in high school, you sat in, in uh, alphabetical order. Um, so there was me, then him. Um, I can't I can't say that I that I knew Michael well in high school because we went to uh, different junior highs and and um, typically you hung out with the friends you'd made in junior high. Um, but I do remember that um, Michael was already Michael, although I had then no idea that he would become an artist. Um, nor do I think he did. Uh, in high schools then, there weren't any art classes. Uh, had there been, I doubt that either of us would have taken them. Uh, in those days, art was square, like poetry. 
We were more interested in uh, movies and jazz. Um, then, um, actually, I don't think I uh, had occasion to see him until I joined the faculty here in 1987. I had, of course, um, heard about his work. Uh, he wasn't exactly a, a famous artist, but something like a legendary artist. Uh, so it happened when I joined the faculty here that uh, uh, we were competitors, sort of, because our classes met at the same time, or at least um, his class overlapped mine, which ran from four to seven on Friday. Um, so sometimes I would try to uh, um, uh, convince Michael that he should bring his students to see the film I was showing. Um, and he was always very graceful in um, declining. Uh, but I mean, partly it was just um, uh, because I, I uh, enjoyed talking to him and um, we could always crack each other up about the absurdities of Cal Arts. Um, there was always something new. Um, one time, though, we did uh, collaborate on a, on a program. Uh, we invited the filmmaker Toby Halicki to present his film, uh, Gone in 60 Seconds, I guess, which is a great car chase movie. I guess Michael and I still had a, a sort of um, interest in cars, which is what we learned in high school. Um, in fact, Michael uh, um, told me he had an uncle who could uh, identify every car by the sound of its engine, um, which impressed him greatly, as it did uh, me. Um, so, um, Haliki came and he was this, um, you know, sort of independent populist filmmaker. Uh, who had a very charming way of uh, ridiculing uh, artists and their pretensions, um, which I think uh, we both enjoyed, and it turned out to be a great event. Um, and I think Michael particularly enjoyed it because he's also a populist artist, and in my experience, a popular artist. Um, someone asked me, uh, you know, um, after his death, what, what, what he did, and I said, he created displacements in space and time, which was the closest I could come to describing his work. Um, but it's, um, it, it puts us, when we watch it, in this situation of, of having an experience that we couldn't otherwise have and it's always, I think, inspired by a, a great generosity. Like um, one example Stephen mentioned, um, you know, keeping a museum open for 24 hours a day. Or his show at the uh, Santa Monica Museum where he uh, um, uh, sort of left the exposed the studs for all of the shows that had ever um, taken place there. Um, which is a really, um, well, let's see, fun work. It makes you feel like a kid exploring this strange space. Um, so I think, you know, he was, he was really a, a popular artist and uh, both in his teaching and in his artwork, a very generous spirit, a generous soul. Thank you. The, th the thing about the alphabet that's really great, I, listening to Tom, I was reminded of uh, 
reading the interview with Betty Asher in uh, Archives of American Art, um, in which she talks about being very proud um, that Michael was not only in the first class to graduate from UC Irvine, but he was the first to graduate. <laughs> um, and I'd like to um, play around a little bit with the alphabet again here now and ask Alan to come up, since his first name is an A. <laughs> Alan Sakula. I, um, yeah, I miss Michael a lot. Um, I, he, was a, he was a good friend. Um, and we used to stand around in the parking lot, and my recollection is this was either be on a Thursday or a Friday um, after these. On Thursday, Michael would have his class, and he would still have energy to talk for a couple hours standing around under those then rather dim street lamps out in the lot next to the freeway here. And we'd talk about artists and school and much as, much as Tom describes it, the latest follies of CalArts. And, uh, and sometimes we'd say, well, we better get into town and since Michael lived on the west side and I lived in Koreatown, we'd, we'd decide to meet up at, uh, at a, a Norm's uh, the, that then stood at uh, La, Cien uh, La Cienega and, uh, and Olympic, kind of Beverly Hills adjacent Norm's coffee shop. And we'd sit there and drink bad coffee until 3 a.m. or so and continue our conversation. So. Um, Michael, Michael was a great one for just talking, you know, and, and uh, you always felt the conversation was, you'd pick it up, you know, you'd pick it up again, and, or you'd phone later and a thread would be uh, re-examined. Re um, and I think as happens with, um, the loss of people you're close to, you, you, um, they, they, that conversation continues. I was, um, I haven't been out much lately, I, uh, but the last time I was kind of out in the world, in, um, I was up in Vancouver and I, I had a show at the little gallery of the, uh, uh, at, at, at um, Simon Fraser University, um, which is sort of, Arthur Erickson designed campus up on the hill in Burnaby. Oh no, it's not Burnaby, it's, yeah, it's Burnaby, uh, which was once described as an Aztec gas station. It was sort of, so, supposed to be the sort of the Berkeley and Santa Cruz of, of uh, British Columbia. Um, and, and it's a gallery with an interesting history given the interesting artists who are in Vancouver. My point in telling this is not, to, not to, that Michael ever did anything there, but to my knowledge, um, but uh, I, I was putting work up in the in the space, and it was fairly um, unproblematic. I mean, it wasn't wasn't like a Michael project where every aspect of the installation is absolutely critically defined and worked out situationally, but. Um, there were there were a few people there, and I was asked to say a few words, and I, I, I mentioned something about Michael, and this was only maybe a, a week or so after he, uh, he passed, and uh, and what had hit me when I first went in the space was uh, the the curator there um, had told me that that uh, it had once been a locker room for a gymnasium that I could I could not in any way fathom how, how it could have been adjacent. So it was a locker room for some distant playing field or a hockey rink or something that was hidden somewhere. And, um, and it was a rather awkward space. You know, the way a lot of the gallery spaces here at CalArts are like A402 upstairs. You know, it's one of these kind of 
drop ceiling rooms that, you know, could be a meat locker for all you know, you know, it, but, but it's had years of art being shown in it. And, and, and suddenly, it was, it was, as I was looking around the space, I, uh, I had kind of this visit from Michael, you know, and uh, it, was, it, was, it was on the order of, look at the air vents. You know, and, and sure enough, I walked over and there was a, a column, you know, an, a, a hollow column in the room, which was very inauspiciously placed. Uh, and and um, there was some kind of heating, air conditioning, vacuum thing there. And there was, a, there was an overpainted metal grill, which had obviously been dislodged over the years and uh, repainted and, you know, kind of was held in by a thick accretion of cheap latex, you know. I mean, any, any student who's put work up here knows exactly what I'm talking about. And, and, and I realized that that was, that Michael would have gone like a, like a, a laser to that artifact in that, in that room, that that would have been what fascinated him. And I found myself sort of kind of dog-like, sort of sniffing at the grill, wondering if I could smell the residue of the locker room that had once been there. And it just seemed that I was inhabited in that moment by Michael's very deliberate materiality of way of working. Um, and I was thinking a nice performance for Michael if we didn't have this post-earthquake renovation with these strange, these baffles that come out would be to somehow recover the holes he drilled in the mezzanine here uh, and uh, fill them with peanut butter and cheese um, and uh, get the high lift from the people in the uh, theater design and, g and give dogs a ride up to, to have a snack from a Michael piece. Um, Michael, one of Michael's favorite phrases was pejorative phrases and, and always was accompanied by a guffaw, was uh, cheese-eating dogs. And he also liked uh, gravy-sucking dogs. But he, he was pretty, pretty good with dogs, I think. I mean, he, there's no way you can teach at CalArts without tolerating. You see, it's the, the doggish ways of humans that sometimes frustrated him, I think. You know, we over-imitate our, our best friends. Um, but I, I'm going to, there's one last anecdote, it's a real CalArts anecdote. Um, one day I came to work and there were, there were uh, yellow leaflets under all the car windshields in the parking lots from the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, IBEW, and apparently they were, there was an attempt to organize the physical plant workers. This was back in, the, I'd say, the late 80s. Um, and uh, the physical plant workers who had a grievance had gone to... Uh, had gone to uh, IBEW because they, they had contracts with the Disney Studios. A lot of the, uh, you know, electricians in the studios who weren't working directly on the, uh, on the productions were, were in, in that union. And uh, so the thought, I guess, in the, uh, the workers here was that, that, that given the presence of uh, Disney family members and associates on the board of trustees, there'd be some sympathy, there'd be a real realization that, that uh, something could be worked out. And Michael and I uh, let it be known to, we just sort of passed the word to uh, some of the guys in physical plant that we'd be willing to sit down with them and see if the faculty could help out. And, um, you know, I can't remember if this was before Stephen was here, so I don't know if he's getting uh, hot under the collar about this story, but I'll, I'll continue with it. Um, it might have been in the days of Bob Fitzpatrick, I really can't remember, but, um, but within, an, you know, you do, every, everything you do at CalArts is public, and, you know, you can't, and certainly us sitting with guys from Physical Plan in the cafeteria and having a conversation was noticed, and um, within an hour or so, we each got calls to come up and see Beverly O'Neill, who was then the provost, and uh, it was, it was really kind of like junior high, you know, it was like we, Michael and I were these two like geeks who thought we could get away with something or have some kind of conversation that was inappropriate and uh, 
we were going to get called up to get talked to by Beverly. And of course, Beverly was very much had the spirit of an artist, you know, so she didn't, um, I'm not saying she had the spirit of a trade unionist necessarily, but she had, um, but, but the hat she, I'm sure it wasn't comfortable to, for her to wear the hat she had to wear in that conversation or that she felt she had to wear. And she said, well, you know, you, you, you can't be talking to the guys in physical plant. And, uh, and I, was, I said, why? Or Michael said, why? You know, we were both sitting there. And uh, she said, well, you're both management. And I said, oh, so you called the lawyers and this, this school's, you know, school has lawyers on retainer for just these sorts of situations. And of course, what they did was cite the 1983 yeshiva decision, which ruled that uh, employee faculty at private universities are, are managers and therefore can't, can't uh, form a union under, under the National Labor Relations Act as kind of exemption. Of course, you can form a union, you just have to do it by other means. There's no, um, but that was the, uh, things kind of didn't go very well for that, but that was our big effort at f faculty, staff, solidarity, which I think remains a, at least a, a glimmer of some, something, if not, if not just pure wonderful folly. Which brings me to my last point, which is Michael's inappropriate laugh, and I know there'll be lots of references to Michael's laugh. There's something to be really said for people who laugh uh, off cue, you know? <laughs> off cue laughter is a sign of, of, um, of, 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 of folly at its best, I think, in, in, in Erasmus's sense, you know? That, um, because that's always the, the cut into something, some fissure point, or some, something that's, a, that's either a problem or an issue or a... Um, and Michael was great at that, you know, and, 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 uh, and it's something I think we need to remember and preserve at CalArts because the, the whole engine of culture now is to get everyone to laugh on cue while they're isolated, while they're in their own little bubble, thinking they're only laughing to, to their own private amusements. And that's why there's such control of graduation here now. There should be no laughter off cue. So we need Michael around as kind of a presence to remind us that uh, off-cue laughter is uh, the road to uh, other, another, all kinds of possible futures that are certainly not guaranteed, but would be better than the ones that the on-cue laugh squad is prescribing for us. Okay. Stephanie Barron. I have to say, I'm loving these photographs. They're very, very beautiful. Um, I first met Michael in 1977, shortly after I started work at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Michael's mother, Betty, good cue. Um, Betty was a curatorial assistant by day at LACMA. Um, when she went home, she was an amazing collector, um, a fierce poker player, um, had a very wry and dry sense of humor. Um, and it was through Betty that I first met Michael and his sister, Raina, we see in a number of photographs. And I have to say, two more different siblings are hard to imagine. Um, after Betty died, Michael approached the task of settling her estate um, over several years um, painstakingly and with his characteristic thoughtful precision and ended up donating many works to LACMA and to MOCA. In 1977, um, Michael and I spent some time together in Munster at the opening of the first uh, sculpture project where he very generously introduced me as a young curator to Caspar Koenig and a number of European artists. Michael's remarkable migrating work in that show has only grown, I think, in complexity over the 30 years. It's the only piece to appear in every iteration of uh, Sculpture Project Munster. And I have to say, it's gonna be hard to imagine going to Munster for the next Sculpture Project and not trying to find his modest little caravan parked somewhere on a street. Um, I knew my, Michael mostly through his artistic practice, but of course heard about his legendary teaching approach. 
Looking at museum exhibitions with him was a particularly eye-opening experience for me. Although I worked with him in the early 80s on his contribution to my exhibition Museum of Sight, and I was glad to hear from Alan about dogs because that project um, revolved around, it was uh, interventions th throughout the campus um, with different works of art or different spaces in the museum. And Michael fixated on um, the Thomas Hart Benton painting of um, uh, the Kentuckian, with Burt Lancaster. And, had us put a special label there, and then it connected somehow to a sign in the park that said all dogs must be kept on leash, and it was in like the LA County Municipal Code 665544, and he had us reproduce that sign, but to exact county specifications. Um, so clearly dogs were part of this. Um, and I saw even in that, in that project um, his unwavering attention to every detail, his quiet but insistent way of getting what you to follow his thinking and to trust his decisions. But it was in the truly collaborative project in the 1990s at LACMA that I was able to experience his unique teaching style in the museum. Through our then experimental education program called LACMA Lab, which was run by Bob Sane, each year, we invited artists to do projects at the museum in an attempt to engage younger audiences at the museum. Michael proposed to work with a group of high school students to reconceptualize and install a single gallery of modern art. 11th graders would be perfect, he said, smart enough to be creative and yet not sophisticated enough to be inhibited by traditional museum methods. And this is what really blew me away. Over the course of three months, Michael met twice a week with a small group of 16 and 17 year olds from Fairfax High to thoroughly redo one gallery with classic modern works of Mondrian, Magritte, Noguchi, Duchamp, Cornell. Because one of the deals we had made was if he was gonna do this, I was gonna give him the gallery with some of the best works in the museum. I wasn't gonna stick it over in some, you know, kind of adjunct space. Um, but there were rules of engagement. Um, they had to accommodate conservation concerns, security concerns, curatorial concerns. And they had to work with everything that was on view. They couldn't take anything away. Um, so they had to kind of figure out how to, how to accommodate it. And what they ended up with didn't look at all like any traditional gallery installation. Watching him interact with these seven teenagers who really had no idea of his reputation in the art world. Endlessly patient, deliberate, critical, probing, pushing them to question every aspect of traditional presentation strategies was, I have to say, for me as a curator, an incredible privilege. He liked that they had no fear of what they didn't know. The resulting installation was truly unusual and proved very popular with visitors. I kept it up um, for a year beyond when it was it's supposed to have its little run. Dark colored walls, jazz playing, recycled bus benches so you could sit on them, mirrors on some of the walls, and most provocatively, um, paintings pulled off the wall and installed on stands. Why? Because in their meetings, they were fascinated to peek at the back of paintings and see all these labels labels that revealed where, what exhibitions pictures had been in, previous ownership, and they said, why, why, why do only you get to see this? Why doesn't the public get to see this? So we actually devised these stands um, so that the paintings were like in the middle of the room and you could kind of walk around them and, and see that. So instead of a white cube, the students created a metaphorical city, a lively place where art was inextricable from life. What struck me most was not the final result, which I loved, but rather the exchange between Michael and these students. It was amazing to watch him interact with them, patient, generous, probing, pushing them to question every aspect of, of the presentation. And he changed their lives. These were students, the, he changed their lives, he changed their families' lives. Several of these students went on to college, they had no plans previously to go to college, and even to art school. 
his generosity, and I think that's going to be a word that's going to continue to be a leitmotif. His persistence, his faith in their abilities to question and challenge was remarkable. His soft-spoken, uncompromising approach made believers of us all and pointed to another way of thinking. Who can ask for a more vital and important contribution? Uh, the, ne the next three contributions are coming from afar, so um, Susan, could you come up and help me out with that? Um, the first is uh, Benjamin Buclo. Benjamin wrote, Michael would have abhorred nothing more than to hear us speak about his greatness as an artist, even though, in my mind at least, he was one of the very great artists of his generation. But greatness in terms of public adulation and visibility was never on his mind. It would be even more of a fatal misunderstanding to talk about the humor of Michael's work. Indeed, as a personable and public presence, his laughter, was the most pervasive that most of us will have ever heard. But as far as Asher's work was concerned, only fools would mistake it for jokes. His work was driven by an annihilating radicality, the desire to literally get to the root of where and when and how false consciousness originates in the field of the visual, in the production and reception of material, rather than textual representations. That this principle of annihilation responded to the larger and more generally ruling conditions that had annihilated subjectivity and social relations in the 20th century is beyond doubt. Michael Asher's work remained unreconciled and inconsolable. Yet for that reason, it was also relentless in its pursuit to dismantle the compensatory effects and comforting services of the cultural industrial complex. The hermetic silences of Michael's work, rightfully perceived as aggressive resistances and refusals by institutions and conventions for the longest time, almost for his entire life, share that radicality with very few artists known to us. Barnett Newman comes to mind. As Newman said, great artists do not open up doors to anything. They close the door on all that is false, promises, and compromises. That, I believe, was and remains the most crucial experience Michael Asher's work gave and will continue to give us. The next contributor is Daniel Buren. Um, And Dan Daniel has written quite a long uh, piece, so um, the slide will show the text in three or four slides. Um. For Michael Asher. We have walked many roads together, met so many times, followed each other, overtaken each other, even taken different paths. We have listened to each other, heard each other, defended each other, and joined forces. We have laughed together enjoyed great laughs so often. We have followed the same roads, both gotten lost and then found our way again. We have embraced each other, convinced each other, and yet stood away from the other, confronted ideas, even fought for some of them. We have exchanged so much, shared friends, convictions, ambitions, places. We have traveled together, we have built projects together. Some were completed while others never saw the light of day. Michael was a unique person. He was discreet, even secretive, and meticulous to the extreme. He was full of humor, warmth, and generosity. He was very hard on himself and his work and lucid in his criticism of the world around him. Though always charming and lovable, he was relentless. 
His work was a constant back and forth between painstaking execution and the forthright, even radical power of its result. If the viewer made the effort to grasp Michael's unmistakable art, he was immediately and abundantly rewarded with pleasure and satisfaction. Once Michael had gotten hold of an idea, he made no concession whatsoever, not to institutions, collectors, critics, the public, let alone the market. He chose to build on and preserve this rare freedom by dedicating himself to teaching, not as a second best alternative in order to survive, not as a job like any other, but as a vocation, a passion to which he gave himself boundlessly and excelled. Michael had a passion for, among other things, teaching. And he was, therefore, an outstanding teacher, dedicating much time and energy to his students. Of his many activities, the legacy he leaves as a teacher, spreading knowledge to the four winds, profoundly influencing dozens and dozens of artists, is undoubtedly one of the most important. Michael worked very slowly, as though he had a all of eternity ahead of him. This was partly because of his temperament, but also and above all because most of his projects required weeks or months of multifaceted research, including travel, consultation, and reading. Such meticulous research, which naturally took a great deal of time, was essential to allowing Michael to decide whether to go on to produce the work. Michael knew that the devil is in the details. Indeed, if there was ever an artist who heeded this, it was him. He knew that nothing should be left to chance. He also knew that God is in the details, and that if you want to create an accomplished work, the details must be perfect. Small things that many other artists deem unimportant were, for Michael, as essential as the whole of which they formed part. Who could forget the weeks he spent roaming in and around Milan looking for the chairs most suited to Ambiente Arte, his work for the 1976 Venice Biennale? At his exhibition at the Pompidou in Paris in 1991, it was the screws he used to hang the specially made coasters that consumed all of his attention. They were defined to the last detail in terms of material, size, and shape, as were the quality, color, and dimensions of the frames used for the objects in that exhibition. This concern for detail made some of the museum curators so hysterical, baffled them to such an extent that the exhibition's head curator resigned. In addition, Michael had to fight up to the last minute to get a badly designed five or six meter long wall, one that in no way reflected what he had requested, heightened by 150 centimeters. At one point over the course of that nightmare, through which I did everything I could to help him, Michael threatened to close the exhibition entirely. In the end, he got his way and the exhibition opened as scheduled. I will end this short homage with an anecdote that evidences our connection, one about a sort of game whose rules we invented for a specific occasion. I was invited to an exhibit in Crayfield in 1982, shortly after the House Esters had been made into a contemporary art museum, as the House Lange had been for 30 years. The director, Gerhard Stork, asked me to suggest an artist with whom to exhibit. I proposed Michael Asher, and he was immediately accepted. I also had to choose one of the two museums. I opted for the newer one of the two, House Esters. Both of the houses were designed by Mies van der Rohe and built in 1928-29, which explains their evident similarities. Michael and I knew each other well and were aware of the kinship of our work. We wanted to avoid influencing each other during the planning of the exhibition. So we decided on a simple and strict rule, 
and asked the director to keep our exhibitions completely secret so that we would not find out about each other's work. Of course, we didn't speak to each other before arriving at Crayfield to set up the exhibitions. How surprised we were when we found out what our respective works consisted of. Michael exhibiting specifically to rotate at 90 degrees and then re reconstruct its entire internal structure. As for me, I had decided to superimpose the exact blueprint of the House Langa without changing its orientation onto House Esther's, which was situated just next door on the same axis. This overlap stopped at the place where the position of the House Langa door coincided exactly with the real door of House Esther's, allowing visitors to enter both spaces at the same time. When superimposed like this, the two blueprints, although by the same architect, clashed radically. Once the blueprint was applied to House Esther's, we reconstructed all the walls of House Langa in striped fabric. If we had set up to do a joint project, we ne would never have come up with something where our work was so enmeshed. The communion of minds evidenced by two works conceived in ignorance of each other and 12,000 kilometers apart speaks louder than anything anyone might say about our respective practices and the way we both analyze a given space in relation to its history as well as its physical appearance and logic. We engaged in a similar sort of game, albeit with different rules and three players. The third was John Knight, several years later at the Pius Gallery in Marseille. A related point, one that, though very obvious to me and extremely important, I almost forgot to mention. Michael Asher is the only artist, to my knowledge, whose work is created specifically for, indeed cannot be separated from, the space in 99% of the cases. Even though Michael never used the term, I would dare to call them in situ. I cannot end this homage to my friend of over 40 years without mentioning how much his condition saddened me in recent years. Nevertheless, those who, like I, witnessed his physical and psychological suffering could only admire and be amazed by his strength of character his unwavering disposition, his laugh, which remained as explosive as ever, and his lucidity in the face of his illness. Therein lies a dazzling lesson in greatness. Paradoxically, after the cruel disappearance of its author, whose passage among us was much too brief, his ephemeral work will now pursue a long life. Dear Michael, Thank you. Thank you for everything. And the, the last one in this particular little group is uh, a very short note from Tom Crow that um, can go on the screen, I think. Um, Tom also sent a f one of the photographs that's in the larger slideshow. Um, a sweet hail and farewell to Michael, an artist and a person who always gave far more than he expected in return, Tom Crow. So Dorit, Dorit Sippus, are you? There you are. Thank you, Tom, and thank you to, sorry, Cal Arts for putting this event on. Um, I'm very grateful to everyone that had something to do with it. Stanley. Um, I'm seeing a lot of people I haven't seen in quite a while, and it's, I'm deeply moved, so I'm a little nervous. I will tell you about my relations with Michael. And uh, I feel very strongly that we're all here because today, um, a little bit of Michael inhabits each of us. Therefore, I feel Michael's presence here. So I'm talking to Michael as well as to all of you. 
Michael, I remember meeting you um, at the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design, where I was an undergraduate student in the early 70s. I knew very little about art. I was a um, textile weaver, um, and I had just dropped out the year before from studying sociology at a university in Montreal because I had felt that uh, my being trained to study others was um, somehow pretentious because I knew that I didn't know who I was. And I actually went to the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design because I had an idea somewhere in me that artists got to ask the question, who am I? I in the large sense, not just I personally, of course the I personal, the subjective is very present, but the notion of I, the philosophical of notion of what is I? It's, it was Caspar Koenig, uh, who was the first director of the Nova Scotia College of Art and Press, who had invited a variety of artists, amazing artists, to come to the um, NESCAD to have books um, published on their work. Michael came under such an invitation. And as I learned only recently by speaking with um, Gary Kennedy, who was the president of NESCAD and the visionary behind the program that brought so many luminary artists to that campus. I wrote him that I was coming to speak um, in tribute of Michael today, and I asked him if he could remember why Casper asked me to work with Michael, work with Michael on the book that Casper was trying to um, initiate. And Gary emailed me back saying that um, Michael was much too slow for Casper. And um, he asked me, I don't, I, I don't know why exactly, thinking that I would have some capacity to um, extricate some detail from Michael about his own work because there wasn't a whole lot written about Michael back in 1972, 73. So I spent long hours, as a very, I was very young myself, fascinated by this guy. Knew nothing about the context in which he was working. Knew very little about art history or the art world. But immediately captivated by this guy who was very slow. He talked very slowly. And it took incredible listening on my part to figure out where the threads were to pull and get him to remember and to uh, elucidate on what his very early work was from 68, 69, 70. And I remember him showing me a picture of one of those works. Um, some of you will be familiar with what I'm talking about. I don't remember, it was uh, in Europe, I don't remember exactly where, where uh, he uh, was given a gallery to work in and he chose to um, carve away a quarter inch all around the perimeter of the room where the floor met the walls. So just carving a very exact quarter inch perimeter around the room and I looked at that image and I imagined myself in that room floating and Michael had made a room float. That's what I understood as a young artist not understanding the context very well of uh, the formal context of where he was coming from. So I was immediately fascinated by this artist who made a room float. That was my beginning relationship with Michael. I then uh, graduated and came to CalArts um, the same year that Michael got his job here in 75. So um, we met again. And again, there's a detail I'd like to share with you. I got an email that early this morning from a friend of mine, a colleague, uh, Janie King, who's I think in the audience, who's writing, uh, has been writing for a number of years, a dissertation on Michael. And she sent me um, uh, a text that she had found in her research, written by Michael, uh, probably in 1974-75, uh, to I don't know who, but in very tiny handwriting, 
um, not script, but what's it called when you write? Uh, print, print. Um, and he mentioned that uh, he had been working with um, me, Dorit, and that he had recently found out that I had signed up for his class at CalArts, and he was very happy because now he could reciprocate. I was so moved by that. You know, that his, uh, it made a lot of sense in hindsight because I really felt often in my years, years of knowing Michael that I was both um, a friend of his, uh, a younger colleague, a student. Um, we were from the same tribe, being Jewish, if you know what I mean. So there were relationships that were kind of beyond what we ever really spoke about, but was there. And it made us very close, um, like family. He, um, in his own way, would let me know when he disapproved of things I did. And um, when I um, took over Foundation for Art Resources, FAR, in 1979, he would, of course, I invited him to be um, on an advisor. And I knew every time I uh, started a project with an artist that he disapproved of, I knew every time. <laughs> so where am I going with this? Um, I wanted to add something to Alan, who talked about Michael's laughter being off cue. Michael's laughter was also off key. And I do remember hours and hours and hours of um, at the two of us and John Knight laughing sometime in the mid to late 70s in Venice for hours in, in hiccups, in, in, in purple faces, in, in gasping for breath, in off-key, off-key. Michael certainly was what you've been, has been described before. Is, uh, he found the absurdities of life quite, quite um, humorous. Um, I also want to thank Michael because I, in hindsight, thinking quite a bit about him since he passed away, realize how much he influenced me very directly in the work um, of social engagement that has been a pursuit of mine for so long but not, uh, on, in, my, in my case, without um, recognizing the subjectivity of the individuals as well as the social relations between them. And I um, realized, I remembered 1977 and the Leica show that Michael did, Tom Jimerson, a uh, local curator um, at the time, put together an exhibition at Leica. And Michael's participation was to um, simply used the furniture that was already in the uh, entry area of Leica and organized it so that the public can just sit and talk. And he made sure that there were at least two or three of his uh, students or ex-students there um, the entire time that Leica was open to engage people in conversation. And I can't get that out of my head that um, I participated in that for days and how, as some of you know that I became a professional mediator in the last um, 10 years of my life. Not in lieu of being an artist, no way, as part of my practice. And I want to thank Michael because I think Michael had something to do with that. Thank you. Um. Dorit mentioned uh, Stanley just now, and I'm going to mess with the alphabet once again and ask Stanley Grinstein to come up. Well, you're all lucky because uh, I wrote these profound notes and now I can't even read them. I don't know what they say. <laughs> so I'll wing it. Uh, Michael's laughter, I mean, that's we think of that. It was just amazing. It was this 
strange combination of Santa Claus and some spiritual um, sound that got into your body and vibrated your body. So it was a, a very special thing. But Michael was so special in everything, and he was one of those people. Look, at he was a genius, and uh, there's very few geniuses in our life. What's a genius? Number one, someone who changes their profession, that, that you may not even like the work, but you're conscious of it. And you could go to places like China, and they know about the work. And the public usually isn't even aware of a lot of these people. The people, the other artists are. And it it's profoundly changes their, their own art and lives on that way. And he also, I think, and I don't say these things lightly, I think his type of life was a type that influenced people um, in this special way that only a few people are at that category. I think of uh, Marcel Duchamp or John Cage. That they don't tell you how to make art, but they tell you something about an approach to life that, could, that you learn from. He was just an amazing person. Um, at least I'm very lucky because we do Betty Asher, who was an amazing lady. Amazing. I mean, she had some of the um, most... Uh, deep thoughts about creation and I'm sure that was a fabulous effect on Michael and, uh, um, and in uh, the early 60s um, at least did a show at uh, the West Side Jewish Center and had a young artist in it a few and uh, Michael Asher was one of them so we were lucky enough to know him for a long time and have him be part of our life. What a, what a very special part. You know, we're so weird about death in the Western society, particularly Los Angeles. Uh, the closest we come is uh, Forest Lawn, which is the uh, Disneyland for the dead. So we deal with it kind of on that level. But um, I think we start with the thought, none of us are going to get out of this alive. So, what does that mean? I mean, the little baby is going to die one day. What, what did you do with those years? What happened with them? And with Michael, I like to think about um, you celebrate it. I mean, you celebrate what a life should be. And we end up uh, going through a regular mourning period, and that's fine, but we're mourning for ourselves. I bet Michael was ready to go. He was in pain. He was not comfortable. And uh, it was the thing to happen his life. It was the time to end. But for us, you know, we have this, this other loss that happens that uh, he's not part of, physically part of our life anymore. But he certainly is as far as spirit and ideas and uh, uh, the, the important things. So to do you a favor, I'll, I'll read the last little thing, and uh, this is short. Uh, we celebrate this genius and know we were privileged to know him and learn from him. Thank God for the Michael Ashers. Nancy Asher, would you like to come? What? <clears throat> I've never been to CalArts before. But I can imagine Michael here, and um, it's like one big test tube. Um, and now I know why he lived where he lived, close to the 405, so he could get here. Uh, as you all know, is that weird? As you all know, 
Michael is a very private person, intensely private. And that makes it hard to speak about him. This is not easy, I'm, I'm, I'm nervous, so excuse me. And I've been waiting for a sign, some kind of security clearance from Michael. Um, I don't know how to describe him either. Words like mysterious, courage, courageous, radical, fascinating, exciting aren't enough. But what a fine fellow, a fine, kind, and gentle man. I can't possibly speak about his contribution to American art. He's my friend, my favorite client, and my moral compass. We all know that with Michael, there is no gap between his principles and his practice. I'm using the present tense right now to talk about him because the thought that he is no longer present is just too painful. I'm still in magical thinking. He'll come back. The truth is, I really love Michael, but it doesn't mean that I always understand him. My husband, Christopher, Christopher Trumbo, who also died recently, understood him better than I do. Chris was very well educated, and they both had a brain as big as a planet. I met Michael in 1992 when he called my office for an appointment. I'm an appraiser of fine art and rare books. He calls because he needs valuation advice for an insurance claim. We make the appointment. I suggest he come in and bring an example of his work and the extent of the damage. Of course, I know who Michael is, or at least I think I do. And of course, everyone in the Los Angeles art world knows his mother, Betty Asher, and her gallery, Asher Four Gallery. He arrives on the given day and shows me a small drawing. I think it's an old graphic design for Documenta or something. I remember looking and saying to myself, there's no there there. He shows me this small sketch, maybe four by three inches, unsigned, ballpoint pen on yellow legal paper in that shaky handwriting. And I'm actually kind of amused. And I say, really? He gracefully listens to all my concerns. How am I going to value your papers or anything for that matter when you've never sold anything? This is before I realize Michael's belief is in the absence of any exchange uh, value. Once we start to understand each other, I can do the work, and in the process, I learn a great deal. With Michael, I think this is probably true of his students also, you always want to do your best work. I continue uh, to work for Michael many times over the years after that. These other assignments are some of the most memorable and joyful of my career. The funny thing is, Michael, who eschews the art market and lives a monkish life, loves to hear about prices and value of art. I'm an appraiser, that's what I do. <laughs> Although it feels subversive, we often talk about the current New York auctions and specula speculate on what will sell or not sell and why. We follow certain artists. <laughs> he takes it quite seriously, but it is also fun. He has great insight and strong opinions. This is the Marcel Duchamp side of Michael. He amazes me with his knowledge of world events and especially with other financial markets. He knows so much about so many things. But you know, he doesn't have a radio or a TV and I've never seen a newspaper in his apartment. I can't remember when he bought a laptop, but it wasn't that long ago. He literally seems to suck information out of the air. So you see, Michael has become a solid point of reference in my life and in my work. Anytime I need advice on an artist or an appraisal problem, I can rely on him for a serious and thoughtful answer. He cuts through difficulties like a laser. Michael is my silver bullet, my secret weapon. On the other hand, his minimalist lifestyle can drive me crazy. After that decrepit old car of his broke down on the way to an important appointment and he had to walk or run a long ways, I was so worried. So naturally, I start to bug him about getting a new car and a cell phone, for God's sake. And how about a comfortable chair or an air conditioner? And I try over and over to get him to move out of that apartment by the freeway and find some place to live with clean, fresh air. He comes close to moving to one of the apartments that I propose, Santa Monica Shores. 
the two mid-century high-rise apartments on the beach in Ocean Park. I bring this up because, as you've seen in some of the photographs, Michael loves to sail. He enjoyed watching the Santa Monica Yacht Club Wednesday afternoon regattas from the window of my office in Venice. When he was a boy, his family had a 40-foot sloop, the Delphine. It was beautiful. When he became unwell, I tried to find sailing magazines for him. Not cruising magazines, racing magazines. In fact, Michael's first artwork was a print of a sailboat that his mother reproduced as a Christmas card in 1956. I actually appraised it in his mother's archive. I describe it as artist, Michael Asher, born 1943, American contemporary, title, Season's Greetings, 1956. <laughs> Description, small horizontal image of two sailboats, a seahorse, the sun, the moon, and the stars above. He was 13. We have a good laugh about this. I think it was the last ordinary work of art that he ever made. <laughs> Michael's excuse for not moving to Santa Monica is that it was too far to get to his doctors. But he finally meets Min and Michelle, the wonderful private nurses who care for him and love him. Thank you, Min and Michelle. And thank you to all the nurses who cared for him. And Yoko, I think everyone here and everyone everywhere knows how carefully you looked after him and how important you are in his life. After one hospital stay, Chris and I asked him to please come to Ojai and recover in our guest house, but he doesn't budge. He never wants to be a burden. He is self-sufficient to a fault. I call and say, Michael, I'm coming down. I'll be on the west side. I've got a basket of fruit or something for you. Let's have lunch or go to the hammer. Only on rare occasions does he agree. Sometimes I push a little harder, especially on the food thing. I bring fresh tangerines, avocados, watermelon juice was a favorite, um, homemade soups and stews. Pie, I should have brought more pie. He loved pie. And if he doesn't let me in, I leave offerings outside his door. Another thing about food, and this really drives me crazy, but it is very funny, all of his kitchen cabinets are filled with books. <laughs> Not a sign of domestic life. <laughs> so, there are, but there are fine times too, when he is warm and relaxed and talks a little. You can see it so many times in some of these photographs. He talks about himself, his life, his work, his family, his future. I treasure those times. And I find some comfort that perhaps he and Christopher are somewhere enjoying their spirit life, where they can live, they can live on in their heads forever, without doctors, free from illness, free from the demands and disappointments of their bodies, and free from nags like me. I see them happy, dancing in the sun and the moon and the stars, dancing in the world of ideas. Goodbye, sweet prince, fair winds, and following seas. Andrew Freeman. So I brought my Michael notepad. Um, when I think about Michael, I think about, I think about the capacity that he had to hold an idea in his mind. I think about his, excuse me, I think about his ability to hold people in mind through his work. When I first met Michael, I was a young artist here and I showed him some photographs. One of the things that happened was there under, I was showing him some images and he refrained from going to the symbolic. He refrained from delving in hyperbole. When I showed him an image, he would read it directly. And from that point, he would move on. And then there are times when this becomes a great relief, when somebody has the presence to look first, 
describe what's there, and then move on to see how it could work. Sometime later in my tenure here as a graduate student, my father used to come and visit Cal Arts, and he had been in a wheelchair since 1967, and so he'd always traveled in a van, in a camper, with a wheelchair lift and self-sufficient like a turtle. And of course, even then, I could see some kind of comparison here. Michael being self-sufficient and sometimes turtle-like. One night after I was uh, done studying here, I went outside and much to my surprise and to my great anxiety initially, there was Michael talking to my father outside of his camper in the parking lot at Cal Arts. <laughs> and I thought, oh shit. <laughs> well, what really happened was they were sharing a moment of engineering. And one of the things that I learned from that brief experience was that I could trust Michael. And what I mean by that is there's a place in our relationships with people in which you understand their capacity to hold something in mind. And oftentimes when you meet somebody who is working with a wheelchair, who has dysfunctions in their body, people, it makes people nervous, and I understand that. It didn't make Michael nervous. Michael was standing there talking to my father about a wheelchair lift that my father had designed and, and offering him improvements. <laughs> Wonderful. So I thought, okay, I can work with this guy. It's okay. So curiosity and respect. You know, I think about Michael, I think about curiosity and his respect and his capacity. Sometime later, we had had a conversation about inexplicably, babies and animals. And I told him, that, you know, I really liked kids, and you know, maybe one day I would think about this, but I was really confused by babies. And Michael pointed out, well, you know, babies are pre-verbal. And I said, okay, I understand this, this makes sense. <laughs> so this leads me to this idea of communication and analysis. And I used to have this blue healer and Michael in the Blue Healer, the star of Michael in the Blue Healer. Uh, there are many of them, but I do remember him coming to Venice to visit. Then I was living with Mara Lawner and he caught Michael coming to the house. And a Blue Healer is a very small dog with a ridiculous personality, giant personality, capable of championing cattle. And Michael confessed or revealed to me that he used to train, I think it was basset hounds or maybe it was beagles. And Chester, Chester was a, quite a willful little guy and at one point I actually had to bite him to get him to stop doing something. But, uh, but Chester would jump up, you know? And, and Michael said, well, I can take care of that. And I thought, this is gonna be amazing. And, and it was amazing because, you know, there is Michael with the dog jumping up on him and he's stepping on, her, on, his to, on his paws in the back, you know? He's like, okay, you jump up, you put your front paws on me, I'm gonna step on your back foot. What happened was, these two stubborn, stubborn critters, because they turned into critters here, started fighting. But they were both playing. I mean, they weren't really mad, you know? So he'd step on the dog's back paw and Chester would bite his feet and then they'd do it again, then they'd do it again, do it again, do it again. Many years later, I realized that they had developed this funny little relationship because I was, I was in my office downstairs. Uh, I was in my office and the dog came in, saw Michael and ran over and jumped up on Michael. And they started doing the same thing again. <laughs> this is 10 years later and the dog doesn't do this anymore. He's done being a puppy, but they had this, this thing going on. Well, all this, you know, I'm thinking about these things and I'm thinking about these things because like many people, I feel respectful and I want to be careful about talking about Michael's personal life, so I want to talk about the things that I know through my experience of him that I think have some fundamental relationship to his capacity for humor, that wonderful laugh that all of us have refrained from trying to mimic, which we all really want to and probably do in the car by ourselves. Um, sometime later, um, 
my, after Michael's mom passed away, and I had the great pleasure, in some cases, and terror in others, of, of photographing, photographing some of her work and her, in her condominium. But at that point, you know, Michael had been invited to do a show uh, by Daniel Buren. And it's interesting, I was very much appreciative of what Mr. Buren wrote. But the title of the work was, Does the Work of Art Take Place? And it was at the Wit de Wit in Rotterdam. And to the best of my knowledge, uh, Michael has typically uh, installed or overseen his own work and his own, his own installation. But I had worked with him making these slides, and we had spent a wonderful amount of time in <clears throat> technical geek land, which was really fun to do with Michael, because in fact, he would do that with you. Uh, professionalism, uh, vocational excellence, uh, these were things that he could really appreciate and appreciated from everybody. I suggest you not make the mistake of being too casual. Uh, at any rate, so we had made this, these slides that were Michael was going to present. And the notion of this exhibition was the idea that the site was unrevealed to the, to the participants. And um, so this work had been made and it was only in slide form. And Michael, of course, decided that he couldn't, couldn't take the time away. And he asked me if I would go. And I said, sure, you bet, absolutely on the way. So I packed up all these slides, and I get on the plane, I go to Rotterdam, we're installing this work. This is, this is where things start to get interesting. So the idea is that these slides will be projected in a particular place in this institution. And I get there, and they had assured Michael that the correct materials would all be there. Well, of course, correct materials being a subjective term. <clears throat> I get the slide projector, I get the lenses. There's a box full of lenses, and they're filthy. I mean, they're dirty. They've been in the closet for I don't know how long. So I call up Michael, and I talk to him about this. I said, look, man, this is not going to work. Um, so we agree we're going to go sort this out. Um, I go to the photo store. I deal with this material. I have to essentially steal the lens out of the, out of the, out of the, uh, the shopkeeper's hand and leave the money there because he doesn't think it'll work. So I have this whole experience. I go there and I talk to one of the gallery, I talk to the gallery director and the gallery director says, well, what happens if this doesn't work? And I said, well, then I put the slides back in the box and I go home because I guess the work of art doesn't take place. And he freaks out. Understandably, I hear him get on the phone, he calls Michael, uh, or I think his assistant calls Michael, and I hear that laugh on the phone. That laugh, that wonderful laugh. And uh, so we work it out, and finally this, in fact, does happen because, of course, the pearly gates open and whatever I need is all of a sudden available, and that is true. And uh, I, got, I get home, I get back to the States, and I'm talking to Michael, and I, I, said, uh, I said, so, you know, how did, how, did that, how did that go? What do you think? He said, that was great. He said, what happened? I said, well, you know, I wasn't getting the help that you needed. And, and you asked me to do this thing, so I thought, okay, I've got to do it the way you would do it. And that is, if it doesn't work, we leave. And uh, I said, so what, so what did you say? And he said, nope, that's exactly what you should do. Put them back in the box and get on the plane and come home, because if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. At some point, and I truly, truly regret this, because of course the conversations one could have with Michael were truly uh, astounding and charming, and they weren't always about big, broad, art-centric, wonderful things. I remember having a very serious conversation about our uh, mutual dislike of t-shirts with pockets on them. I, um, I remember whittling our way through a, a description of the difference between sympathy, empathy, and the uh, concepts of compassion. I think about those phone calls, and I regret to this day the night that Michael called me again at 11 o'clock, and we were having ongoing conversation, and I was thinking about what Alan said about the thread. These threads were, uh, should be cherished. And I said, I was working like crazy, and I said, Michael, I, I, can't, I can't take calls after 11. I, I'm just too tired. 
for the next 15 years. I regret saying that because never again would he cross that boundary out of respect, out of, that's what you said, that's what you need. Sometime later, Michael and I met a lion. We, uh, we were uh, working together. Michael was uh, invited to do a piece for the Sao Paulo Biennial in 1998, and uh, we were going to do some photographic work together. And uh, we spent two 10-day or so trips in Texas from Brownsville up to um, El Paso along the border, the West Texas border and the Rio Grande photographing colonias. The notion at this very simple level was that the colonias were very similar in many ways, lacking infrastructure and uh, uh, the support they needed and represented a million, more than a million people living in poverty. And Michael was making a kind of direct comparison and challenging a kind of myth that artists would only go to Brazil, to Sao Paulo, and photograph the favelas there. And he was using this material. So we spent this time bouncing around in the car. And it was hot, just, it's brutally hot. This is the summer that everything died in Texas. I mean, from Brownsville on up, everything's gone. It's 110 all the time. <clears throat> at any rate, at some point, we, uh, we hang a left down a dirt road, and we're looking for uh, one of these unconventional, unincorporated sites. And we end up at the Rio Grande, and there's a small shop there. And at that shop, there is actually a tow barge that goes across the Rio Grande. And behind the shop is a tractor trailer, just the trailer section. Two sides have been cut out of this trailer. The doors have been left. The back was still there, what I'm calling the back. One short side, one long side, and what had been welded in the place were one inch bars approximately 10 or so inches apart. And inside this thing is a lion, a full size lion. And so Michael and I went out and we're talking about this lion. We're looking at this lion and, and we end up discussing degrees of nature and culture or what is the nature of culture, because we start speaking about the bowling balls that are in the lion's cage for toys, and the motorcycle tire, and what the cat must think of these, and how he must not care about the difference. And I do remember Michael at one point saying, well, I don't know you, how you'd get a ball of string in there quite big enough. <laughs> and so these wonderful, these wonderful moments, you know, example to me, for me, uh, not only an invitation into a kind of personal space of interaction, but represented many of the experiences that I knew of him as an artist, uh, this facile mind, this capacity. On that same trip, um, to follow another small thread, uh, Michael and I had had a little bit of a tiff. We had some fight about something I don't know what it was exactly, but of course, you know, uh, being in a fight with Michael meant, that, that's a long, long commitment. Um, and we were gonna be in a car for 10 days, and you know, and finally I said, you know, we're acting like little old men. And he said, yeah. Well, later that day, there was no other comment to be made. Later that day, we, uh, I guess, uh, Later that day, we go to one of the many wonderful eateries that were immediately available along byways and highways, and we go into the restaurant, and we sit down, and we have our lunch. Car's still running in the parking lot because I'm trying to keep the film cold, so we just got two sets of keys and left the air conditioning. I mean, it was a disaster. Um, and we sit down, we have lunch, and Michael says, well, I'm going to have a piece of pie. And, and I said, wow, that's great. I was like, yes, you're going to go over to the wild side here a little bit. And then he says, well, it's my birthday. That was really, really touching. In Los Angeles, if you were to go out to eat with them, sometimes you would run into somebody around the corner 
Mexican restaurant around the corner from his house. And you would go in there just so we're all sure that Michael's effect wasn't limited to those of us in the know, those of us who fancy ourselves as artists or critics or thinkers or people in the discipline. Michael had an enormous effect on many, many people. You know, the, as I once said, you know, what Michael has offered us is, is, uh, is something that is far greater than the initial offering it because it's what you make of it. But we go to this restaurant around the corner from his house, which is someplace that he would go frequently because, in fact, his books are, his cupboards are filled with books, and there you know, it really is only a piece of one jar of yogurt in the fridge. Um, we go around the corner, and uh, we go into this restaurant, and this very nice woman comes over and says, would you like the Michael Tostada? <laughs> I'm like, Michael, what the hell is the Michael Tostada? So he describes the Tostada. And I said, no. Why does the Michael Tostada exist? And that was, you know, that was a way you could sort of get to him in terms of, in terms of letting him decide whether or not he would reveal what was going on with him personally or physically. So why does this Michael Tostada exist? But they were charmed that they had a Michael Tostada. It was not called the Michael Asher Tostada because they couldn't have cared less about that. It was called the Michael Tostada. As far as his, uh, his travels in the automobile and our worries about that, I can't imagine that there is a single colleague that saw Michael drive that wasn't worried about his commute. Um, it wasn't that he was a bad driver, it was that he, would, he was persistent. If he was here till two, he would drive home. Occasionally in the old days, I guess, he would sleep in the office, although I never knew that to be true. Um, but after the second time, yeah, I'm sure it is true. I just said I didn't know if it was, just to be precise. Um, anyway, so I knew my, Michael had wrecked, destroyed his car one time driving home, and then another time I knew that he had fallen asleep and wrecked, not wrecked his car, but driven it off the road. And we were talking to, the, talking to him about this, and I said, look, man, if you wreck your car and we don't have you anymore, then I'm going to be kind of cranky. And I said, worse yet, you could take somebody else with you. And that got to him. He thought really seriously about what that responsibility was because, of course, Michael would give as much as he could. And it was not, I think, what sometimes is characterized as an act of martyrdom. He had an interest in it. It was his effort. This was his job. That was a life. That was the way to work. So it wasn't just self-sacrifice. It was commitment. But as far as the car was concerned, you know, it's like, okay, look, you got to get a little bit more sleep. And selfishly, I wanted to keep him around. Traveling with Michael was always pretty much of an adventure. Um, I realized on the way to the airport to go to Texas and then seeing him in New York a couple of times that I carried more things in my pocket than Michael had his actual luggage. And, and he had the capacity to uh, pack a backpack for a trip and still have plenty of room for the catalogs that he would need to pick up on the way home. And I always, always admired this, this ability to keep cut and run. At the point at which he'd done the, done the piece at the Santa Monica Museum, um, again, back to the, the love of the conversation of techni techniques and professionalism. I was talking to him about the wonderful photographs that Grant Mumford had made, and he was talking about them, and he was saying, you know, he's worried about the effect of the beauty of the images distracting from the reality of what he was trying to disclose. And I said, uh, well, how long did you torture the man before you told him to take an aerial picture? And he uh, started with that great laugh because, of course, he wanted to see what would come. And, of course, I think Mumford did make the photograph from above. But, you know, he had this real interest in seeing somebody play out their own abilities and their, their, their uh, own way of working to see where it would mesh with his own and what he might offer them or what he might learn. The last thing I want to say is... Um, 
These days I can only remember about 12 phone numbers. Uh, a few of them are, are just go to recordings like 911. Um, and I think there's something about the, the fracture of contemporary life, you know, the cell phone, and we know what those arguments are. Uh, but I think about the idea of holding something in mind, the ability to retain something that represents. And that I remember Michael's phone number off the top of my head gives me a sense of comfort that's not just about, oh, that's my friend. You know, I'm going to miss my friend and a mentor. But it reminds me of what it means to hold something in your mind and why that might matter and then how you might use it. I'm sure like many other people, the, the notion of saying it aloud is difficult because of course it would be difficult. Um, I understood some of, some, of, some of our conversations, Michael and my conversations, to be utterly private. Um, but I will say, I really loved that man. He was a great friend, a wonderful artist, as we all know. And a terrific example, a great, great deal of fun. And I am very, very grateful to have known this man. That's all I got to say. Thank you. Um, Anne Goldstein and Chris Williams are in Amsterdam, um, but this morning sent us um, a short note. We are grateful for the tremendous gift of Michael's work and his extraordinary example as an artist, which not only changed the course of art history, and with it, our ideas about art, it, for, it is forever rooted in our DNA. This person we so deeply admired as a mentor, a history-making artist, whose work made our work possible, also gave us the privilege of friendship, which became more and more precious to us over the years. Michael was a dear friend to both of us, and we are grateful for every moment we had with him and for all of the time he so generously invested in us his interest in always wanting to know what we were doing, his curiosity about our work, and his care about us. Now, we are living 6,000 miles from LA, but our trips back always included a visit with Michael. With every departure from LA, we didn't know if we would see him again. We were actually in LA at the time of his passing, and though we spoke in the days before, it was only the trip where we weren't able to see him. As ill as we knew he was, it is still crushing to bear his absence. And we are only starting to process our grief, still actively missing him, missing our visits, our talks, our discussions about art, his clarity, his enthusiasm, his voice, his laugh, his presence. He lived and worked in the same way, with integrity, rigor, curiosity, and modesty. His health became his last project, and the goal was simple, to get better so that he could be able to do his work. Over the past couple of years, he had wonderful caregivers. We got to know a couple of them. It was clear that, it was clear that they deeply cared about him and developed a real affection for Michael. And how could they not? We are grateful to them as we are to Yoko for her extraordinary grace and never-ending thoughtfulness, and to her and Dee for everything they have done for him. We are so sorry we cannot be here today, but we are grateful to be here with these few words. The words truly fail to express how we feel about Michael and our love for him. Dan Graham sent us a video from his studio in New York.
It was through John Baldessari that I became acquainted with Mike Lasher's work uh, and fell in love with it immediately. Uh, uh, when I was teaching uh, at UCSD in San Diego, uh, uh, John Baldessari was also teaching and he brought Michael in, Michael in as, a, as, as a lecturer. Uh, and I just uh, absolutely felt uh, very attracted to and, and, and very close to the, work, to the work he showed. Uh, uh, later, when I went to, to Los Angeles, uh, I stayed in Michael's small place uh, in, San, uh, in, San, in, San, in Santa Monica. Uh, even though I know he had a, 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 a kind of foam rubber mat and I slept on the floor, uh, he also liked to tend to his small Volkswagen. Uh, he was uh, uh, almost, almost, uh, almost like living with an artist who lived in poverty. Although I know Michael came from a much better, but nicer background. Um, some, uh, it's, it, it, both Michael and I, seem uh, in our work, seem to have been very influenced uh, by Dan Flavin. And in fact, uh, uh, Michael's work is uh, less about institutional critique, but more about architecture. Uh, particularly, he was particularly involved in the work, I think, with, with uh, the acoustical feeling of the space, uh, 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 color, light, uh, and the way the body interacts, uh, interacts with the architecture. Uh, but the work was really about uh, the gallery as architecture, and maybe, maybe has an had an affinity to Monica Clark's work. They're both cancers, and the, the work was both, the, both, both uh, about post-World War II architecture, uh, Michael introduced me to his, through his interest in architecture uh, to, uh, uh, to 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 uh, Los Angeles post -World, World World War II architecture. Uh, uh, case study people like Neutra were very involved with uh, with with, uh, uh, with a, a, a glass a, a glass facade that had sliding doors. Uh, Michael, Michael and and his friend John Knight used to talk about sliders. So basically, uh, that's why I got one of the that's why one of the way, reasons I got very involved in architecture. Uh, I think I, I think Michael's work at some point influenced uh, Bruce Nauman, uh, and uh, and certainly certainly also may have influenced uh, 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 Paul McCarthy. Uh, but uh, the most interesting thing that happened was uh, 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 was uh, Dan Flavin, who seemed to love both of our works equally. Uh, 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 invited Michael and I to, uh, uh, to have a meeting with Heiner Friedrich to be part of DIA. Uh, um, uh, Heiner looked at Michael and said, we have to get you better shoes. Uh, and although Michael seemed to be anti, very anti-gallery, in fact he did a show, a very good show, in, in both in Cologne and Munich with Heiner, Heiner's gallery. Uh, and. Um, um, I decided I, I didn't want to have anything to do with Dia because I'm a populist uh, and Dia seemed to be very elitist. Uh, uh, Michael actually wound up doing some beautiful shows with galleries, uh, some of which I organized. A show at, at the Zelda Gallery in in Los Angeles, uh, in in in, uh, in, um, uh, uh, in Milan. Also a show at the Sim Gallery, uh, and uh, um, uh, again. Like like Bonnie Clark and my work, like alterations of urban houses, work involved cutting away to reveal, although less is more, uh, uh, literally rather than the Mies van der Rohe for formalistic idea of less is more. For the Tosali show, uh, 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 it was the first show show of the year uh, of the season, uh, and the the gallery had had kind of kind of kind of uh, stu stu stucco walls. So what Michael did was he cut away the stucco, uh, revealing what was what was underneath. Uh, uh, so it was kind of rough, and and, and the light coruscated, coruscated uh, as you walk through it, S setting up a kind of light situation, as well as uh, otherwise the shock, uh, the shock of, of experiencing, experiencing the gallery, uh, uh, the, the, the gallery, the, the, uh, the gallery, the gallery, the gallery structure revealed. Um, a lot of Michael's work really has a lot had a lot to do with light as, uh, and, and, and and color. I think influenced by Flavin as my work was also very influenced by Flavin. Uh, uh, Flavin deconstructed the, the gallery space, but, but looked at it from an architecture and light point of view, and I think Michael did the same thing. Uh, Michael and I became extremely close friends, uh, and, if, and, and we had an emotional rapport uh, that I think was enormous. Uh, uh, although there was one problem, when I, uh, I, when I did my DIA piece uh, in New York, uh, 
uh, uh, Michael thought it wasn't it wasn't deconstructing and, and challenging the, 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 the museum structure. Uh, 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 he liked the cafe because he liked to hang out at cafes. Whereas in fact, I was trying to change the dia uh, by making make, make, making the space the the root the dia in, into a kind of seventeen self-centered space in his corporate atrium, and I basically wanted to change the dia in, in, into another structure. So my, so so I think we had a falling a falling out because uh, uh, because my work is not about institutional critique, but I was very supportive of, of the museum and, and seeing it in a new, in a new light. Uh, but every time I gave lectures uh, in Los Angeles, Michael was there, and his response to my lectures were very emotional and personal. Uh, I, I dearly miss him. Is Connie here? Connie Hatch? Yeah. This is a real education at CalArts, <laughs> because there's so many things I thought I knew about Michael, and yet there's so much more, and I hope it will be collected so that so many more of his students will know so much more. Um, Michael was my friend. Let me take a breath. I've been practicing two whole days without crying. And yes, it's true, Michael did sleep in his office at CalArts. I don't know what Fizplant thinks about that, but it's a fact. Um, for the last 20 years, off and on, I had the great joy and privilege of sharing an office with Michael. Um, he was a great friend, um, personable, absolutely opinionated about everything. He taught me so much, and yet I'm still so jealous that I was never a student of his. Just a co-worker, but that was so serious. His job here at CalArts uh, affected his colleagues in so many ways. We fought, we struggled, and he's probably the first guy who proved to me that there are male feminists. <laughs> Which is no small feat, I think. Um, at, even at a place like CalArts where everything is just so exquisitely taken to task. Michael being the major person who asked those tough questions of his students. And as a young artist, learning to teach at CalArts, been here since, first came here in 82. Michael didn't come to my lecture, but he heard about it the next day and asked me to come to his class. So I dutifully did, and yes, we talked until way past 11.30 that night. Um, talking to Michael, yeah. For a good 15 years, I had lunch and or dinner with Michael every single week. There was tips. Anybody remember tips? The Saugus Cafe, uh, that's before all this other mess happened. Um, and yeah, Michael had this very curious, very special diet. 
Um, you would always look very carefully through the menu, even though we'd been there a thousand times, very carefully. You would always order the patty melt, a cup of coffee, chocolate chip cookie for dessert, and, and on a special occasion, we would split a piece of chocolate cake. He enjoyed so much listening to his students, and then again later in the evening talking with me or whoever else was there about each and every one of them. He took the work here so seriously. I miss him so much. And Andy, I don't think I'll take his phone number off my speed dial. I'm so blessed to have known him, and I know you feel the same. We are actually hoping to create a sort of archive of today. Um, we have a, a memorial box up at the top end of the gallery and ask all of you to um, think of writing um, down memories or stories or, or whatever and uh, we'll be inviting the speakers to maybe donate their notes. Um, the, the next two uh, people are also absent. If we could just go to this slide. Um, Michael's work, along with his ideas about the position of the artist in the world at large, has been my primary reference frame for more than three decades. Although the last few years, the vicissitudes of life made for longer periods during which we did not see each other, I always strongly felt and feel his presence in the way I think about art. It is very hard to comprehend the loss, but this time, there is no way back. This makes me very, very sad. That, that was Frederick Lien in, uh, in Belgium. Um, and I have a, a, a short letter here from Rena Kramen. Um, she's, um, I am Rena Kr Michael Kramen, Michael Asher's first cousin. I wish I could be with you today but recent surgery prevents my traveling so far. Michael's mother, Betty, and my father, James, known as Jim outside of California, were siblings. Growing up, Michael and I didn't see each other too often since he lived in Los Angeles and I in Chicago. When my family visited the Ashers, I usually played with Michael's sister, Raina, who was four months younger than me. Sadly, she died when she was about 42. However, when I went to Los Angeles in 1993, I believe it was, for a celebration of Aunt Betty and her contributions to the Los Angeles world of art, Michael and I spent hours walking and talking and developing a lovely relationship. From then on, we would talk on the phone about monthly, sharing what was going on in our lives and giving each other support when needed. We were the only two left in our family and with a similar history and knowledge of various family members and events. He had many difficult things with which to deal, and he handled them all with dignity. He never lost his temper, but thought through things before acting. I was always impressed with how well he did this. Michael was so humble and modest. I knew about his exhibits around the world, and he sometimes sent me brochures about some of them. But it wasn't until I read about him in, online that I learned about his many awards. He'd never said a word about any of them to me. I haven't fully wrapped my brain around the fact that Michael is no longer a phone call away. My wish is that all of us will gain strength and comfort from all the special memories we have of him. With love and peace, Raina. Uh, Elsa Longhauser?
I met Michael Asher in 2001 at the Patty Four Gallery. I was visiting Patty when Michael walked in. I asked him immediately if he would agree to show at our museum. He said yes, essentially he would, but that it took him a long time, often many years, to determine what he would ultimately do. Six years later, in 2007, Michael came to say that he had figured out what the exhibition would be. We would construct all of the temporary walls that had been built to accommodate the 44 shows mounted since the museum moved to Bergamot Station in 1998. We scheduled the exhibition for January 2008, which fortuitously was our 20th anniversary. The plan was to show 10 years of Samoa's history at Bergamot by revealing the framework for each show, the dimensions and location of every temporary wall without showing any of the actual art. Even though the logistics for Michael's projects were daunting, everyone at the museum loved him. The registrars who had to locate all of the floor plans, the installation technicians, the construction crew, the catalog designer, the guards who explained the installation to be Muse visitors. Michael was always kind, thoughtful, thorough, respectful, clear, and good humor, good humored. His assistant Yoko was equally wonderful. Michael inspired and permanently affected my work. His absolute precision in thinking, writing, and talking. His refusal to entertain any form of sentimentality. His attention to detail. His singular point of view. His pure vision. Michael was at the museum every day during the installation walking around and pondering the piece. I kept asking, what do you think? I don't know yet, he said. The exhibition opened on Friday night, January 25th, 2008. On Saturday afternoon, Benjamin Buclo gave a staring lecture. And later that night, there was a party at the Grinsteins. Michael, though visibly tired, was present at each event. I think he was pleased. I think he was happy. The very next day, on Sunday, without telling anyone, Michael took himself to Cedar sinai Hospital, where he was admitted on the spot for quadruple bypass heart surgery. Although Michael recovered, he was never quite, again, his robust self. During the years following the exhibition, I saw Michael fairly regularly. He never complained. He did careful research into the best, most effective treatments, and he continued to do his work. He even won the Buxbaum Prize for his contribution to the Whitney Biennial. One day, after one of his hospital stays, I called up to say I had made chicken soup for him and would bring it over. When I arrived at his house, which was also his archive with my large kettle of soup, I asked if he had a pot to heat it up in. Sure, he said. He opened the refrigerator, and there in the refrigerator was one pot, one plate, one knife, one fork, and a spoon. Why are these in the refrigerator, I asked. He said, and you've all heard this by now, because the cupboards are all filled with books. And why just one of everything? That was a dumb question. I really didn't have to ask. Precision, no aestheticizing, nothing extraneous, a focus on the essential. About a year later, when I called Michael and offered to bring him something else that I had cooked, he said, no. <laughs> Thank you, but no. 
clearly I had upset his domestic order once before and it was not going to happen again. <laughs> I phoned Michael one day a few months ago to see if I could talk with him and come for a visit. He had by this time developed a strong bond of friendship and respect for his brilliant nurses, Michelle and Min, and the team they had assembled to take care of him. The nurse said, he's resting and can't come to the phone. Two days later, Michael died. I imagine that Michael died with the same elegance and a plum that he brought to everything else in his life. Thank you. Uh, Stefan Pasha. Um, one of the disadvantages of being a P is that you've heard everyone below P say everything you're going to say over again. <laughs> well, despite that, here's my take. Um, I need these now. Um, I was a student here in the mid-1990s, and it was in this hall beside that column over there that I first encountered Michael. He was seated at a table interviewing prospects for his post-studio class, and I was one of them. I stood there awaiting my turn, fidgeting no doubt, with terrifying tales of post-studio critique and its fearsome facilitator playing in my head. Michael was the primary reason I had come to CalArts, though in truth I didn't know a thing about him, only the rumors. But there amidst the chaotic buzz of a CalArts registration was a much welcomed and welcoming calm. Meek in appearance, scrawling away at that antique clipboard of his, not at all what I had expected. Michael would soon help liberate me from other such preconceptions, or perhaps more accurately, as he would probably like to say, help me liberate myself. When the time came, I sat down and made my jittery introduction. Unperturbed, he reached gently across the table, greeted me with a warm, outstretched arm, those squinting eyes, and that giant, infectious grin. He asked me what I wanted to do, putting me immediately on the hot seat, and I was hooked forever. We're here today to honor Michael Asher in a place that was very much his home, because it's here that Michael felt most at home. Yet I can't help but wonder if he would approve of all this. More than likely, he'd be embarrassed. Michael was the most unassuming individual. He didn't want the spotlight. In fact, he dedicated his entire career to deflecting it, pointing it the other way, onto things that warranted illumination. After almost 40 years teaching at CalArts, practically its entire history, it's near impossible to think of the place without him. Yet for someone fortunate enough to have been touched by Michael, there is simply no way to get him out of my mind and my heart. His impact on art makers, both ex-students and others, is nothing short of extraordinary. How many, when struggling through a particular problem, have asked themselves, what would Michael think? Or what would Michael say? Or more importantly, perhaps, how did he think that way? I've heard that voice, and I know others have heard it too. Not as paralysis, as is sometimes said, but rather as a summoning to accountability. He held us accountable so that we would hold ourselves that way. Speaking through that very transformation, the voice became, what do I think? What do I want to say? It functions as a sort of conscience. That was one of Michael's greatest contributions, instilling a conscience and a consciousness. It, it permeated his teaching, his artistic practice, and the way in which he lived his life, his interactions with other people. If Michael was about anything, he was about taking responsibility, and he expected the same from you. You need not have been his student or an art maker to recognize this. It's right there in his work. 
And if you truly engage with it or chose to engage with him, you entered into a sort of pact, both a challenge and a gift. It requires you keep your end of the deal. Michael was the real deal. And dealing with Michael was not a short-term commitment. There's just not enough time to say all of the things I need to say about Michael. To do so, to do something thoroughly, to respect it, you need lots of time. That I got from Michael, both the idea of rigor and time itself, which he gave most liberally. His notion of time rubbed against what is commonly held as the norm. To a great extent, he spent his life reminding us of that difference. His is a model that is all but impossible to live up to. What's remarkable is that we feel obliged to. I don't really need to say much about the details of Michael's teaching, his method methodology in particular, nor about his extraordinary contribution to art history. Both have been well noted, although, although perhaps not significantly enough in print. And with regard spe specifically to his teaching, it's not always gotten right. The predominant mythology spectacularizes the atypical length of his class, leaving out its content or ethos, its transformative value, and the quality of his commitment, which made it much more than an academic exercise, rather a dynamic culture, and although he'd probably hate to admit it, an institution in its own right. But it's Michael the person that I mainly want to talk about, his character, offering a few of the qualities that made his a very special soul. The codes of existence informing his teaching, his artistic practice, and his daily conduct. So first, commitment. His dedication to teaching is, is without equal, as I'm sure is pretty obvious by now, uh, on a par with his passion for art. For Michael, teaching articulated a more general dedication to a set of ideas, core values, principles from which he could not be moved. He was stubborn in the best sense. His profound belief in what he held to be right, a deep ethical and even moral conviction, was truly contagious, as was his passion for learning. He considered the work of art, as he did the classroom, as an instrument with which to parlay those principles and an opportunity to help form a more aware and responsive community. Both artwork and teaching were expre expressions of that conviction. Equality, democracy, honesty, and fairness were all aspects of a fundamental ethical code which Michael regularly practiced. Perhaps a hangover for the 60s that formed him, he refused to let them go, carrying these ideals with him throughout his life. He felt them deeply in his bones, truly believing in real equality between people, that people should not only be free to choose, but that we must choose and be given an equal shot. A general concern for agency underwrote his decisions. Transparency and directness guided his thought and action. Extraordinary attentiveness to, attentiveness, attentiveness to detail was its methodological corollary. Michael thought deeply, though he was not theoretical. He simply did it and with remarkable consistency across everything he did, regardless of popular trends. He held steady, never wavered, but was not inflexible. He loved a good argument and would defer to a beautiful exposition. Logic he appreciated most of all, and used it to support his choices, attitudes, and even his fundamental beliefs. Ready-made and universal, everyone could follow it. He thrived on working through problems, not guiding the hand. For Michael, it was all tied together. His practice, teaching, and living, driven by an underlying structure of belief that had to be reckoned with. His focus was intense without alienating or intimidating those who came within its purview. In fact, he had such an exceptional gentleness about him, I can't imagine he ever raised his voice. His kind demeanor would embarrass disarm even the staunchest adversary. And I swear he must have won many arguments with that kindness, although it was genuine, not at all contrived. Michael trod, li trod lightly on the world in which he operated and somehow got it to shake. He shook things up, not through force of violence nor even through his massive charm, but rather through radical clarity, clarity rectitude, deferral, and grace. 
And did I leave out humor? Which, of course, everyone has noted so far. Uh, his contagious laugh, as I think Tom first noted in that piece in Easter Borneo, uh, quote unquote, said it all. That raucous Zen howl of his, finding the humorous in things, practicing humor, a powerful mediating device th through which he both interpreted the world and connected to it. His gestures, part sincere, part jest, displayed more of the prankster than is generally acknowledged, and I care to disagree with Professor Buclo in that account. Um, humor combined with implacable seriousness is a lethal combination. There is something hilarious about an industrial blower as a work of art, and something truly perverse. His greatest discovery, perhaps, and weapon, was, that, was perversity combined with strict logic. And it's serious also. That blower might just blow you over. Michael, though, was not full of air. He practiced what he believed, what he spoke, and did so with such an economy of means. His gigantic modesty and excessive humility ran right through every aspect of his being and his work. What is perhaps most remarkable is how such minimal material investment could produce such considerable effect. His self-effacing disposition, the thrifty ecology of his practice, even his apparent dozing off in class, he never said too much. Each manifest a prudence, elegant in its intelligence and its generosity. On the day they gave out egos, Michael went missing. But he was there when you called, and always a tremendous support. He not only gave of his time, but he listened, and he cared deeply about what you had to say, no matter what it was. In fact, he would remember every detail and every conversation, even though you'd rather he, perhaps he didn't. He always returned a call and, and quick, even when he knew that call would turn into a three or four hour conversation. The same disposition to generosity extended to his work and to his notion of art in general. He didn't want it to be necessarily easy, but necessarily available, accessible and understandable to all. It was a kind of gift, and for Michael, giving came quite naturally. He made me many such gifts, not the least of which was conversation. Michael both loved and deeply believed in conversation, self-regulating and generative, and opposed everything that would shut it down. His art and teaching were first and foremost about enabling dialogue as an open-ended exchange. He favored exper experimental structures that permitted taking chances with little emphasis on success, successful outcome or definitive closure. It wasn't so much success he opposed, but what constituted it. He simply didn't care about all the things that most people did. But then he wasn't like most people. To put it bluntly, he was exemplary. Michael's last two works at the Whitney Biennial and the Pomona College piece are characterist, characterist, characteristically dealt with the museum, although not explicitly its architecture, collection, specific economies, or commerce. The works called for keeping the doors open 24-7, granting continu continuous public access, refuting temporal constraint. Ultimately, they pose just one question. Who does the museum serve? Ultimately, who does art serve? Fittingly, fittingly, these works are about people, the viewing audience itself, because it's, because it's people that Michael cared most about. John Cage once said about himself, and I swear I didn't know there was going to be a John Cage in this performance, but I wrote this before. John Cage, uh, and he came up in another talk. John Cage once said about himself that he shows the audience he loves them by getting out of the way, getting out of their way. It is nothing short of miraculous how someone who always positioned himself out of the way would make his presence felt as strongly as Michael did are now the same in his absence. I am forever grateful that he let me into his life, so very thankful for his many gifts. I'll suspect I'll always maintain a certain dialogue with him, and yet I'll, will, I will sor sorely miss those conversations. Thank you. Uh, Birgit Pel Peltzer.
I apologize for my bad English and even worse pronunciation. And also may be there will be, as there were many speeches, a bit repetition often. I still wonder, what was the art of Michael Asher about? Neither provocation, nor mimesis, nor playground for experience, nor materi materialization of a new object, nor pathos, nor enthusiasm, nor denigration, nor salemanship, nor art of selling oneself, nor efficient communication, nor useful art. It was, unlike of this, a detached art of deduction that comes enucleate most of the time in an artistic context, a given reality. This is not the place to comment on the work. I would just mention a few features from an unpredictable encounter. Coming from another world, the old European academic area of philosophy, the Husserl archive, literary criticism and feminism, I met the work of uh, the work and the person of Michael Asher for the first time at the Stiedelijk van Abel Museum in Eindhoven in 1977. The person I instantly found marvelous. Concerning the work, I was immediately intrigued by a very singular act, imperceptible, imperceptible and operating. Here and now unfolded a proposition to remove all the glass sailing panels in one half of the museum so that the light could fall directly and to put them back each day during the course of the exhibition to again cover and filter gradually the light. The end of the, of the replacement meaning the end of the exhibition. The space thus was transformed by an impersonal incident seemingly innocuous. This approach without generating an object, without addition, without qualities, mobilizing instead absence, emptiness in poor light, yet produced something more complex than a simple disturbance of readability and perception routines. It was a totally new conception of the use of institutional space. This act, which took its energy from a slight depletion, a production of absence, was also no doubt an aesthetic experience. It directly seemed to me that, like a red thread, it would allow to clarify the annoying mystery that I felt facing many productions in contemporary art. From there begins a confident, friendly exchange. In 1978, we were together in Halifax with, among others, Daniel Buren, Dan Graham, Dara Birnbaum, and da Dara Birnbaum and Isa Gensken for a kind of seminar organized by Benjamin Buklo at the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. In 1979, during a trip to California with a friend, we visited Michael Asher. Invited at his house in Venice, I remember, he said, handling a glass of water. The glass is clean, but the water, I don't re remember the exact sentence, only the fact that with his hu typical humor, it produced a caustic reversal of the expected proof. After, the, after that, he took us to the houses of Schindler. Following our many conversations, he asked me to write essays about his work at the Renaissance Society in Chicago in 1990, the Centre Pompidou in Paris, the Kunsthalle in Bern, the Palais des Beaux-Arts in Brussels, all very differentiated interventions, but turning around the same points, the same core. The, the difficulty, the challenge, because the text for the catalog was supposed to be done often before the opening. Um, well, attendez. Well, it was often to write before the piece was physically concretized somehow in a time contraction. Impossible to evoke here the passionate discussions we had, free, open, and transient. They were focused, they were focused primarily, of course, on his proposal 
investigating in the institutional structure and, it, structure and its history the unexpected implications which occur, which occur when attention shifts from the objects to, the, to their more than intricate conditions. In short, the meetings were precious. We sometimes met also in exhibitions of other artists, such, for example, as that of his friend, Daniel Buren, at the Entrepôt Lenné in Bordeaux in 1992. Between them, I could feel here there was a strong artistic and personal support. Except for the first one, I could attend also his participations all 10 years in the Sculpture Project in Münster. It was an appointment with Michael and with his constantly repeated same intervention. It consisted, consisted, as you know, of moving for a period of 19 weeks into 19 different places in the city, a trailer home rented for the occasion. Every time we went together all over the town to discover the works by other artists, the lapidary deciphering by Michael of what was proposed to us in terms of public sculpture was like oxygen, I must say. We also laughed a lot along the way. Having written the introduction to his piece in the catalog, I met again Michael Asher in New York in 1999 in the Museum of Modern Art for the opening of the exhibition Museum as a Muse, Artist Reflect. His work, as you know, a list of the museums, the accessions since the beginning of the collection, his work seemed barely perceived. When after the opening we went, a few of us, to the Japanese restaurant behind the MoMA, I remember the skeptical ast astonishment of both Michael Asher and Daniel Buren to notice in what extent the museum was become, no matter under what label, institutional critique or situational, situational aesthetic or site specificity or conceptual art of any way, how much the museum, the mu how much the museum was become a thematic issue constituting it as a genre, somehow like landscape painting, a genre, a team open to illustration and improvement. Anyhow, a result not exactly in the sense of their respective practice. We spoke at times on the phone, but I saw Michael Asher the last time in 2005 in Chicago when he moved for a certain time at the Art Institute the stat statue of George Washington. Once again, his act operated directly with the real. And again, this immediacy included its antithesis, an extreme reflexive mediation. This variation on the displacement of George Washington became a sophisticated analytical device, an equation in the, in the complexities of spurious accuracy. Whatever Michael Asher approached, his practice included an in indefinable ingredient, generally termed as humor, but which was maybe, in the end, a matter of an extremely singular relation to reality. Reality where his specific reflection on art was imperturbably used as a whetstone. Nevertheless, his sober relation to art testifies with a strange virulence, artistic demand. The qualities I admired most, besides this acrobatic and always unexpected achievement in the logic of paradox and void, were his unfailing honesty, rigor, requirement. To go back to my first perplexity, how does one locate what is at stake in his various interventions? There are cures displacement, substitution, removal. But what, is their what, but what is their purpose, their aim? In his own words, his practice seeks to register, quote, the final ungraspability of what the work shares with the institution. 
ungraspable world operating. My glasses are here. <laughs> my, dicks, my dyslexia got the worst of me, so it's actually Kirsi Peltomaki now. I knew Michael first and foremost as an artist and a friend, but it all started here. When I was an MFA student, Michael was on leave and only came back for what was my last semester. And even then, he only did independent studies. And just here, actually hearing Stefan speak made me uh, remember the registration experience of standing in line, waiting for people, um, talking to Michael, trying to convince him to take, the, him, um, take them on, because he made you write an, an essay, basically to um, convince him that uh, um, there was a good reason for, for, the, for you to study with him. So I didn't personally have that legendary post-studio experience, but I did have an opportunity to do an independent study with him. His impact on my artwork and thinking can perhaps be described through an anecdote, an exchange that involves flowers, exhibition spaces, and social relations. I met with Michael to talk about my thesis show, a friend of mine had sent me a bouquet of flowers. Where I'm from, that's what people do for art openings. I placed the flowers in a vase on the floor of the gallery, next to the doorway, in what was um, a fairly unobtrusive corner. Uh, so it seemed. When Michael came in to see the show, he looked around, and then he focused on the flowers. This changes everything, he said. And of course it did. It's not exactly what I wanted to hear at the time, but he was absolutely right. The flowers changed everything. Michael's work as an artist had that quality of changing everything. Yes, many of his works were subtle, while others were very visible. But all of them fundamentally transformed the conditions of their possibility. They were audacious. They were sensational in the best sense of the term. His works changed institutions. They changed people. They opened up possibilities for doing things differently, of making meaning and conceptualizing meaning that was already there. His work was based on an immense degree of respect and belief in the people involved. He never underestimated anyone's intelligence or capacity to make something out of the work. There was a lot of trust involved, and indeed, you know, these are the themes that I think many of us come back to. Trust. He would ask people, to, uh, people and institutions to do things that were risky, in addition to being out of the ordinary. Yet he never asked anyone to lose themselves, to become somebody that they weren't. Trust was met by respect. Art was not about escape. It was serious, but it was also an absolute pleasure. It was everyday life. It was uh, his life. As an artist, teacher, and human being, Michael changed everything for countless people. He was marvelously fun to hang out with. He was more focused than should humanly be possible, yet he was genuinely interested in and cared about other people. When we talked on the phone during those, indeed, hours-long conversations, he would ask about uh, my partner, our kids, my teaching. That's incredible, he would say. There was a sense of marvel and delight in the way in which he responded to the world, the way in which, indeed, he laughed. His generosity was boundless, even more remarkable because of its unassuming nature. Knowing Michael was a privilege. Learning about his work continues to be a privilege. His work is challenging, surprising, and delightful. Its effects cannot be depleted or contained. His work is never cynical, never superficial, and never 
condescending. There are many legacies of Michael and his work. His artistic method, the institutional impact, the force of his critical insight, and his terrifyingly focused tenacity. But to me, perhaps the most significant legacy, his most significant legacy, has to do with his profound honesty, generosity, and respect for art, for life, and fellow human beings. Um, Kirsty's mention of the flowers just reminds me that I had something to say about flowers. Um, obviously, events like this often, or more than often, always have a floral arrangement. Um, and it was clear from the beginning that that would not be the appropriate thing um, for Michael. Um, so in conversations with Brian O'Connell and then Doreen Morrissey, um, we got to this, which is... Um, an arrangement of uh, foliage harvested from the Cal Arts property. Um, so it just, um, Stephen Prina. Dear Michael, it's been a while. I thought this is as good a time as any to catch up. Last year, Jose Luis and I drove out to see your contribution to It Happened at Pomona. Yes, we conspired to arrive at night after the normal opening hours would have concluded. We thought it was the appropriate action to take. The added value factor was avoiding rush hour traffic. Within the context of an historical exhibition, your work maintained the ability to insert a present tense aspect that delivers still. The tacit ideological nod with the security guards completed the ritual of complicity. Thank you. The experience prompted me to reflect on the time we spent together at CalArts and beyond. It is true that the names of John Baldessari and Douglas Hubler got me to take the plunge moved to California from Illinois in 1978 and enroll in the graduate program there. Besides my amazement that two such esteemed artists could be part of the same faculty, it was not until I arrived on campus that I realized that the Michael Asher on faculty was the Michael Asher whose work had begun to work on me so profoundly and the unsuspecting third year drawing class that I formally introduced to your work at Northern Illinois University. CalArts offered certainly an embarrassment of riches in terms of available mentors, introducing me to John Borofsky and Barbara Kruger in the process, for instance. Your example as an educator branded me for life. Being a teacher was part of your practice as an artist, not a chore that stood apart from it. Casually offering me a copy of Herkheimer's and Adorno's Dialectic of Enlightenment as if it were a compendium of bedtime stories, suggesting that the culture industry, enlightenment as mass deception, might hold interest for me, was the way you went about your work. They proved to be effective bedtime stories in that they and other shared materials permeated my daily life decisively. On another occasion, you announced the visit of a young art historian to your class with galley proofs for an as yet unpublished essay. He was Benjamin Bouclot. The essay was Figures of Authority, Ciphers of Regression. Suffice it to say, I had never encountered an essay such as this, nor witnessed the polemical finesse of such a writer in the flesh. Your message was clear. We as a class had garnered your respect and deserved this intimate introduction to what would become a significant subsequent journey. The respect is mutual. Thank you. I thought I had figured it all out before I arrived at CalArts. The landlocked Midwestern boy would complete his studies in California in two years and then, of course, move to New York to seal the deal, so to speak. In those two years, however, I was called upon to scrutinize the limits of my practice or, in a word, to become politicized. 
What would it mean, for instance, to entertain strategies of deconstruction in the domain of the post-studio, but carry on business as usual when making career choices? I chose to stay in California, work closely with those valued peers I came to know from CalArts, such as Chris Williams, and embark upon a commitment to education that is gratifying for me to this day. Thank you. There are those who would typify you as a contrarian. I never th thought that to be the case. Rather, you interrogated the perceived limits or received ideals, ideas until they were revealed as being as arbitrary as anything else we encounter. Yours was an extended and intricately woven vision of the way the world works. Not that we always agreed, as Cindy Menard so handily reminded me last week. You might not endorse even the epistolary approach that I adopt for this bit of writing, for example. Once, a couple of years after my graduate studies were complete, and around the time you were working on the Museum Hauselange project in 1982, over dinner I thought aloud that this newly described project of rotating the existing floor plan of the Mies van der Rohe design 90 degrees, extending those fabricated walls from interior to exterior space, shared some affinities with the staggered, layered walls built for your contribution to 24 young Los Angeles artists at LACMA in 1971. You rejected my proposition vigorously, to state it mildly. Perhaps your response was based on the premise that once one of your works is made public, it becomes part of public record. You resist the compulsion to repeat strenuously. In retrospect, it, it is obvious that other artists, such as Lawrence Wiener, locate a strategy and make manifestations of it with variation so as to get it into culture. This lesson of distinction in and of itself is useful, but our disagreement spurred me on to another observation. I am not you. An important observation, you might agree, to be had in the face of such a powerful mentor. Thank you. Your laughter is much noted, that tremendous eruption. Another reaction I recall, however, is after having been the last presenter on the last panel of the last day of a symposium addressing the future of theory organized by Charles Gaines et al. at the Pacific Design Center, I opened my rendition for, I opened with my rendition for vocal and guitar of A Case of You by Joni Mitchell. You said I was brave. I didn't consider it an act of bravery on my part, but thank you anyway. Most importantly, thank you for your time. Love, Stephen. P.S. I know I've never said that to you before, but again, I thought there is no time like the present. Ann Lorimer. I think I'm last. I don't know about the least part. Um, <laughs> LA without Michael will never be the same for me and of course for everyone who knew him. I first met Michael in the late 70s prior to his participation in the 73rd American Exhibition in summer 79 at the Art Institute of Chicago where I was then a curator. For this exhibition, Michael realized his, his iconic work involving the weathered bronze sculpture of George Washington. The sculpture, one of many early 20th century casts from the original marble by the 18th century French sculptor Jean-Antoine Houdin, had been standing under the central arch of the Art Institute's neo-Renaissance facade for over six decades. After quite some days spent encircling the museum's building and walking through it countless times and making long lists on his lined yellow legal pad of paper, Michael finally came up with a solution for his work. But this was not the solution that would come to be realized. He first proposed that the large lions facing up and down Michigan Avenue outside of the entrance to the Art Institute 
be reversed to face each other. I was delegated to phone Michael soon after his return to LA to break the news that this was neither feasible nor affordable. A long silence followed, and I offered to call back, by which time Michael had rebounded from his, dis from his disappointment. And what he then proposed was the moving, the famous moving of George Washington indoors and upstairs for po positioning in the center of the small square gallery, Gallery 219 at the time, amidst other 18th century European work, since the original white marble by Houdin, standing in the state capitol building in Virginia, is dated 1788. Just parenthetically, you can see this marble in the movie Lincoln, I recently noticed with great excitement. <laughs> um, this proposal, too, had its curatorial obstacles, one of which was to get permission from the curator in charge of the 18th century objects on display for the placement of George in the middle of Gallery 219. Michael and I took this curator to lunch to reverse a categorical no. For one, the curator had said the statue's stone base was too heavy for the floor. And moreover, he, and most importantly, he did not want this rather mediocre bronze cast to block the viewing of his newly acquired, highly expensive gilt and carved commode by a famous 18th century cabinet maker. Fortunately, a number of martinis later, my colleague had agreed to George's temporary positioning in his gallery. <laughs> Not too long after meeting Michael in Chicago, I headed to LA to find out more about his work with the idea, or the excuse, I guess, with the excuse of writing an article, the one that would have come out in art form in 1980. Over the ensuing decades, Michael became a lodestar for me, pulling me out to the West Coast to see him whenever I could get away. <laughs> Much time was devoted to refining and writing up his ideas for work that was meant for the Art Institute's permanent collection involving hired viewers, but, but which was ultimately exhibited temporarily instead in 1982 in the next American exhibition, the 74th. On my subsequent visits, after I had left the Art Institute, we spent innumerable, innumerable hours looking at new works of his. Michael became more and more animated in the wee hours of the night, indefatigably explaining details as I held up sl each slide while peering through one of those little magnifying loops. I feel so fortunate to have been part of Michael's orbit, meeting through him, many of the friends I have here, still have here. When visiting him, Michael would take me all around the city to see architecture or to see an exhibition. I sat patiently in the car if he had an appointment. And finally, when the slide viewing of his latest installation might round off the evening hours, perhaps having previously eaten dinner at one of his habitual haunts, I fell asleep on the mattress he had provided for me under his desk, and in later years, beside the deep row of file cabinets. On rare occasions, I was able to coincide with Michael in Europe. Especially memorable was the time in Paris when he was preparing his exhibition at the Centre Pompidou in 1991. For this exhibition, he had to resolve myriad details with the curatorial staff we heard earlier related to his installation on the gallery walls of paper bookmarks abandoned by readers in the Pompidou Library. Birgit Pelser came to Paris from Brussels at that time, and I remember that we three walked for miles one day, talking heatedly about many things and being ever so critical, especially Michael, of some of the latest fads in aesthetic production. Having said that LA would never be the same without Michael, I should add that life has been indelibly enriched by knowing and working with him. But more importantly, and most positively, the world of art and art's history 
will never be the same in the wake, no pun intended, in the wake of Michael's unpresented thinking, thinking and of his extraordinary influence. Above all, Michael's art has changed the course of art as previously known. Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone who's spoken so far. We're going to take a little break from, um, from the word. Um, Vicky Ray, who's on the faculty at CalArts Music School, is going to play a piece by John Cage. It's called In a Landscape from 1948. Thank you.
Thank you. You know, in a recent interview, Michael was being asked about, um, about the class and what he thought about it. And one of the most amazing things that uh, he said was that he felt that the, the greatest gift that he'd given, and I'm paraphrasing, the, the greatest gift that he'd given his students was that he'd taken the clock out of the equation, um, which is really a fabulous way of thinking about the way he taught. We can't do that, though. <laughs> um, it's um, quarter past four. Um, the idea for the next segment of this event was to open it up to the floor. Um, we can do that for a little piece, but we are going to have to face the reality of the clock and that um, this space becomes used for something else. Um, Nancy Michnik has flown here from Detroit and is very keen to say something. Um, and I, if other people who maybe are interested in speaking could come down to the front, that would be very helpful. Um, as I said before, we'll, we'll be serving uh, some light refreshments starting just after 4.30 in Langley. Um, so there's relief in sight. <laughs> uh, Nancy Michnik. <clears throat> this isn't written down. Um, I just wanted to speak because I think I'm a living example of Michael Asher's tremendous largesse. I'm a committed, romantic, intuitive painter, and we shared an office for almost 10 years, and we became friends. I was our relationship had a bizarre intimacy because he was extremely organized and very proud of his logic. And I was wildly disorganized and very unhappy about my own inability to function in an orderly way. So when we began to kind of go out sometimes, I'd visit his home, he'd say, let's have a popsicle for dinner, the guy's about to come by. I'd beg him and plead to go to a restaurant, sometimes he won, sometimes I won. But also, let me just address this issue of the refrigerator. I never saw yogurt in that refrigerator. I only saw film, <laughs> ever. There was, I never saw anything in the refrigerator, much a pot or a plate. And I often asked if I could bring him chicken soup or something, anything, and he always refused. He was very clear about it. But um, our rather intense intimacy took place around his filing system. And it was a great pleasure for Michael, I think, and it was wildly interesting to me because it was so out of my range of experience to sit with him for hours and look through the drawers of files and have him explain to me what show, what time, what he was thinking about, how that worked, how it didn't work, and this went on for years. This went on after I left CalArts. I visited him every time I came to California, pretty much. And I don't know. I mean, it was a strange communication. And at some point, I think process, we talked about students, our love of teaching. There were some strange similarities, but they were so separate from each other's lives. And then there became a way that we kind of, from such different points of view, joined up in a very abstract place, separate from both of us. And I could not, I could not, rem not that I just can't remember. Even when it was happening, I didn't know what it was about. But whatever it was, it was hilarious. We both laughed. I have a rather loud laugh, too. I think we terrified students in the office. They had no idea what was going on. We chortled and clucked. I don't... It was about something that had to do with art and perception and experience and maybe joy. And it was magic and it was undecipherable. I was terrified when Catherine Lord put me in that office. I'd been to CalArts before, one semester, and I didn't know enough to even know who John Baldessari was. But by the time I came back, I had a clue. And I thought it was incredibly cruel to put me in this office with distinguished Michael Asher and his, what, two-ton highway fastener and the blue sleeping bag. 
where is the highway fastener somewhere near? And then there'd be times when the highway fastener would move from one side of the office to the other, which was impossible. It weighed at least 600 pounds. He was a mystery, Michael was. But in the beginning, I thought he just hated me. I couldn't imagine, imagine Michael Asher having sympathy for a person like me in any way. And then as years went by, I realized it was just my work that he hated. He was wildly fond of me. And I was fond of him. And maybe because, maybe because I was so outside his ken and not a mentee and not someone who was ever going to change my work because of a hole in a wall or a relationship to Freud or even the amazing, um, Oh, the piece he made out of radiators for the working people in France, or the piece where he brought all the radiators down from the top floor of a Swiss museum. The, the thing that we got to share, which sometimes was irritating, and it would go on for hours, and he certainly never asked me about my process particularly, but he would tell me about what he was thinking about what was wrong with the work. I was... Able, I was his audience sometimes. Sometimes I felt like an art mom, which I don't mean to be irreverent, but he would talk about going to Switzerland, not figuring it out, the frustration, going back, still not figuring it out. And then when it would happen, you know, of course, never for an openly aesthetic, he would never cop to an aesthetic. It always evolved from a complex set of great investigations, but it would end up always so beautiful. I didn't mention that to him. I knew it would have pissed him off. And at some point, not so very long ago, I realized from his travels that he was looking for a heart, that he was going around to different hospitals hoping that, that there'd be a doctor who would allow him a heart. And during that time, we talked a lot. At one point, I had to ask him for a letter of recommendation for a very particular situation where, again, there were only conceptual artists in the setup. And finally, he liked a body of work I made. It was about Detroit and very minimal. So that was a great thing for me towards the end. And one time, I had a wild, wild dream, and I sent him a long letter about it. And the dream was that really Michael Asher was a rock and roll star and his day job was being an artist. And I don't know, I just miss him. Even walking around the mall in Santa Monica doesn't seem right without thinking of him there with the files and at the desk. Thank you, I know you've been hearing a lot of things, but that's all I can say, bye-bye. Ria Tajiri. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, well, I wanted to say something before I left, and um, I, I was thinking a lot about, you know, um, Michael's class and uh, being a student of his. I I was remembering his critiques and. <laughs> Uh, how, how slowly and so beautifully and carefully he would build these elaborate arguments that nobody could understand and <laughs> they seemed completely improbable and completely annoying. And <laughs> we would sit there and sit there, all of us smoking cigarettes, drinking coffee, and then about, I don't know, 15, 20, 30 minutes in, we'd suddenly it would click. And it would be like, oh my God, he's right. I understand what he's saying. And, and so it was incredible. Like, and then everything would start to build and we would start to really move and, and take things apart. And it was, it was an incredible thing for me as a young artist to just see how, um, how layered and um, um, complex art could be 
you know, how to build these layers. And, and, and then it also, as I got to know Michael and hang out with him and would talk with him about his art, I, I started to learn about his process and it was, that was incredible as well, just to understand um, how a work can be built um, in that way and his research. Um, there's two more things I want to mention. One was I was um, driving across country, I think it was 1979, and um, I, I'm from Chicago. <laughs> And he said, you know, I'm going to be in Chicago this summer, stop by the Art Institute, you know, you can come and see this work that I'm doing. So I was like, okay. <laughs> and um, so uh, I, I think I called, and he said, call the Art Institute, ask for this person, Ann Rormer. And so I called and he said, yeah, come on down. And so um, it was a complete, I, I got to visit him and I, I grew up in Chicago, went to the museum a million times, did high school. But I was always on the exhibition side of the museum. And um, for the first time, I got to actually go behind the facade and go behind the scenes and go where, to where the curator sat, which was amazing, because all of these like, incredible pieces were just sort of like just hanging out on the floor and on the seat. I don't know, it was just really amazing. And um, he started to explain to me um, his thinking about this piece that he was working on, the one that Anne was talking about with George Washington. And, he kind of unraveled this research in the history of the site and the museum, the placement of this particular statue, the artist, the original intent. And you know, he really made me aware of how history and the institution were intertwined. And I think out of that, I think that was so influential in my own work. You know? And so you know, now I work a lot with these, these, also these elements um, in a really completely different way. The other thing I was gonna say was just, um, I remember, um, uh, being in his class, and on Fridays, um, I wanted to, I needed to go down to the valley because um, I think I needed to go see my parents. And he would drop me off. He would, you know, we get off the 405. It was kind of on the way home, and he would drop me off. And then, in the process of dropping me off, we would inevitably end up being parked outside my parents' house for like an hour and a half, just talking about God knows what, but like it would just be, and then sometimes my father would come out and he'd be like, oh, who is that? <laughs> who are you talking to? And I'm like, that's Michael Asher. It's one of my, you know, professors. Anyway, I just, I, I two, other th two other things come to mind. You know, I, I hadn't seen him in a long time. And it was about, I guess 2007, 2000, it was right before the Santa Monica show, right? And I just called him on a whim and he said, yeah, come on down. And yeah, and we also before, you know, I forget, we also always went to, to uh, have dinner at this weird place up here, this coffee shop. He had always ordered the same thing. I think it was like a, um, either a tuna melt on rye or a, a Swiss melt, or, yeah, it was weird. So um, he told me to meet him at this coffee shop and um, it was right before, I had just started teaching and he was giving me some advice. It was really kind of amazing just to be getting advice from Michael about teaching. And um, it was right before I got my job where I'm teaching now. And we just, he, I guess he had just started to talk about his health and how he was eating better. He'd really cleaned up his act. He ordered a plate of broccoli and something else. Unbelievable. And, um, and then he also was really kind enough to say, you know, you, you should come to the opening. I, fortunately, I wasn't going to be in town, but, you know, after I got back, I had heard that, you know, he'd gotten very sick. Um, and then th the last time I remember talking to him, and I, I distinctly remember thinking, you know, this might be the last time I get a chance to get him because I, I, we kept missing each other. And I uh, just very spontaneously one day, um, and I live in Philadelphia, picked up the phone and said, you know, I'm just going to call him. And I had left millions of messages. You know, he was very sick. I didn't want to bother him. Um, this time he actually picked up and he, we talked. And we talked for a good hour. And I remembered just, I wanted to cry. I, I knew um, it's probably going to be the last time I talked to him, but I knew I really couldn't do that. I really needed to just um, be excited for him and be. Um, give him everything I had at that moment to be very um, positive and present. So, um, but I remember, you know, it was almost as though we had, um, people talked about that thread, it was almost as though we had not even, it was almost as though I had just talked to him yesterday. He, we had this con continuum of that con those conversations, you know, back in the car. <laughs> we were just still talking about the same stuff. So anyways, just wanted to share that and how much he means to me. So thank you.
Hi. Um, I just have one quick uh, story to tell about Michael Asher, and it's been ringing in my head um, ever since I got here. Um, this, is, this happened in Post Studio, uh, my second year at CalArts, and uh, I remember we were on break for dinner, so we had left campus to get food. Um, after we gotten our food, we decided to swing by and get some ice cream as well. So myself, uh, my friend Kara and James were in line for the ice cream, when I think it was Kara who suggests, do you think we should get ice cream from Michael? And it was like a really serious question because does he eat ice cream? Will he like it? Will he even take it? But we were like, no, no, fuck it. Let's, let's just do it. Let's get the ice cream. And then the next question was, what flavor? And then, but that was a dumb question because it's obvious. We got him vanilla. <clears throat> So we come back to class, and um, people are still arriving. Not everybody's there yet. We're eating in class, and we go up to them collectively with the bag stretched out. And inside the bag, there's the cup of ice cream with a lid, a single spoon, and a napkin. And we're like, hey, Michael, um, do you like ice cream? And he was sitting in his chair with one foot crossed, kind of staring down at the ground. And he looks up, and he goes, uh-huh, uh, ice cream? Yes, I like ice cream. <laughs> like, here, we got you some. And we held it out, but he wouldn't take it. He just kind of looked at it, then looked at us, and he's like, oh, um, um, how much? I'm like, no, 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 we got you. And he was reaching back into his pocket when he realizes that we're not, we didn't tell him who paid, so he doesn't know who to hand the money to. So he's, you know, he's like kind of foiled there. He's like, okay. Uh, and he just kind of, he's like, no, no, well, let me pay. And we're like, no, 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 this is for you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, it, the thing that finally got him, though, it, you know, the, I, I think because he, he couldn't just take the ice cream because he wanted it. Like, he needed, like, a, like a structure, right? By, like, a means to accept the ice cream. <clears throat> so we finally said, Michael, it's going to melt. <laughs> and he's, thank you. And he took it, and he ate the ice cream. Um, the best part, though, I, I don't think it was the next week, but maybe it was the week after that. Again, we had taken a break for dinner, and my friends and I were still lingering in the class, and I think he waited till everybody left, and then he walked over to us, and he's like, um, are you guys going off campus to eat? And we were like, yes. Will you be getting ice cream? <laughs> and we're like, yeah. And then like, he pulls out his five, and he's like, could you get me some ice cream? And then we're like, yeah, sure. And I'm like, when we were like, no, no, we'll just get it for you. And he's like, no, 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 here, here, here's the money. Um, vanilla. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it, thank you. Um, I came to know Michael over the last 10 years while researching and writing my dissertation on his work. And as we've already spoken today, Michael was someone for whom precision and accuracy were of utmost importance. So when I was thinking about how to pay tribute to, to someone who was so careful about his own reception, I wanted to share today some of his own words on his own work. And because Michael is a meticulous archivist of his own correspondence, copies of which he generously shared with many of us here, um, I thought this would be an easy task. But in going through Michael's letters and writings, I discovered something that I, I, I knew but had never fully registered, which is how dominated they are by laconic technical details, not the type of prose I imagined giving voice to Michael in this setting. So for example, here's an excerpt from a 1969 letter that Michael wrote to curator Jennifer Licht at MoMA discussing a sound piece he was working on for Spaces. Dear Jenny, since our telephone conversation, I have gotten a general idea of a work I would like to execute. The idea concer concerns noise defining a space somewhere in the area of 25 feet by 30 feet. The ceiling height would have to be eight, between 8 to 10 feet. All walls should be floor to ceiling. The instruments are simple, a noise generator, an amplifier, and a speaker or two. The speakers may have to be set into a wall. 
It is important to conceal the equipment in an adjoining room where two four by three by three feet speakers can be placed side by side. And it goes on for some time in this vein. And just to show you that this kind of writing is typical of what one finds in Michael's letters, here's another example written to James Monty, a curator at the Whitney Museum, um, proposing an artwork, um, describing a proposal for an artwork there. And here Michael writes, Dear Jim, enclosed, please find four drawings. Three are for the room space, and, two, and one pertains to two air columns. I find the room space the most interesting. The room space is 20 feet by 20 feet and has been completely whited out. There are two 30-inch openings on one side. Both run from floor to ceiling nine feet. Two corners have a two and a half foot radius, and those are the corners opposite the openings. There are five floodlights of 250 to, 30 watt, to 300 watts equally spaced and flush with the ceiling. This room can be put up in a corner so as to use two existing walls, or it may be placed alone. I decided to go ahead and share these examples because Michael's attention to physical details ultimately does evoke, I think, much of what was special about Michael, his rigorously exacting standards, and his close attention to the execution of a work as much as the idea behind it. Last night, I finally came across a piece of writing by Michael that does call to mind the more self-reflective self aspects of his practice. Not long after I met him, Michael gave me a copy of a talk he delivered at the Serpentine Gallery in 2003. And what I want to share in closing is the first few sentences of that talk, which I think offer a way of remembering Michael's queen, keen but quiet intelligence about his own work. So here's Michael in 2003. The topic of this lecture, experimentation, is a word I forbid myself to use in the first 20 years of making art. In a sense, I thought it was an alibi or a way of rationalizing a failure of a work. But in the 1990s, this changed somewhat when I was willing to take a greater risk in my work. Rather than contradicting agreed upon conditions with an opposing theory, I allowed indeterminacies into the production of works of art. These indeterminacies couldn't be abandoned if I felt they didn't function properly. By doing this, I was hopefully underscoring that it isn't the artwork per se that is important. It is the attendant problems the artwork animates and what is revealed by these questions. Thank you. Um, my name is Linda Toddich, and I was a CalArts 1979 to 84. And I was hemming and hawing about whether to come up here and to read what I wrote, but I absolutely have to now after this last presentation because although I was here and I got a BFA, it was an interdisciplinary BFA actually, it was in the first year they gave them out between the art and the music schools, I actually have been making my livelihood and a career as an archivist of film, video, audio, and digital collections, and I really have to credit Michael for that. Uh, because what I say, and actually then I taught archiving at NYU for the last eight years, is that he taught me how to think. You know, about how, and that is, I think, the greatest testimony any teacher can actually give to their students, and to have that kind of impact on them. But I do have two anecdotes then that I just want to relay about my experiences with Michael after. Well, actually, he, he was my mentor in the art school. I started in the music school here at CalArts. When I decided to shift over to the art school, I have no idea why he accepted me. Here I was. As First a composer and then a harpsichordist, give me a break. I wanted to make experimental films, but in the art school, not in the film school. But I don't know, he, he said, sure, I'll take you on, and, you know, and took post-studio. And again, as I say, he really taught me how to think. But here, okay, the two anecdotes. So after I graduated, I was still you know, making films, and I started working on a script on Bertolt Brecht. And this was probably around 1986. And so I called up Michael and asked him if he'd like to go on an adventure in search of Brecht and visit all of Brecht's houses where he had lived in Los Angeles. So he said, sure. And he brought along a Polaroid camera. And he took photos of all the houses where Brecht was. And I, I still have them. I have to find them. I just moved back from New York. They're in a box somewhere. 
Um, but he was like the best companion for the day that I could have. He was layering the historical over the current. He was listening to my arguments that Brecht was actually an extension of the late romantic tradition. And it was the women who influenced and maybe sometimes co-wrote his works who were the true Marxists. And all our discussions while driving around LA were filled with his humor and it was like having a private class on the 101. It was, it was just great. But you know, I moved away from LA in uh, 1990 and the last time I saw him was in the late 1990s when I was visiting. And at that time I was working at the University of Georgia as the director of the Peabody Awards archive, so a broadcasting archive. And I was telling him about a project that I was developing through the archive to preserve and catalog works in the Peabody Awards collection that related to African Americans. And I mentioned to him that I really missed making art and films and music. And he disagreed. And he said that my current archival work was totally in line with the work that I had been doing before to bring out and juxtapose histories and that I'm still making work. And that was so Michael, you know, to look beneath the obvious of a person or a thing and see something deeper in how a person operates. And in fact, I told my NYU students, I was, came early back from a conference. I was in Seattle this year and uh, a conference of archivists I've been going to for 22 years. And it was only the second time I left early to come back here, you know, to uh, give tribute to Michael. And I saw 25 of my students, they're out there working in the field as professionals. And they said, oh, why are you leaving early? I said, because I have to go to my mentor's you know, memorial. And I said, he taught me how to think, which I think I have tried to convey to all of you, then all of you archivists. And so you are now the beneficiaries of what I learned from Michael. And I think there are a few of them there in the class who are going to then carry it forward in their work as well. And I'm really happy to see that, that Michael lives on in everything that we all do. Thank you, Michael. I, I think we might need to draw this section to an end. Um, so please come into Langley and, and, and we can have a more informal remembering over there and that's up in the back. Um, I'd like to thank everyone who has helped make this go, be such a moving event and move so smoothly through it. Um, and um, yes, thank you. Thank you.